preface of conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of antinomians and neonomians. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of antinomians and neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. The author's preface to the British divines in which is shown the occasion and design of the work. Reverend and very learned sirs, brethren and fellow labourers in Christ Jesus, our common Lord, most dearly beloved. In my apprehension it was never better with the Christian people than when sincerely attentive to believe the gospel, to live in a holy manner, and to banish far the quirks of curious questions, they delighted themselves in the pure love of God and Christ, and in the certain expectation of eternal life. So the first generation of believers had learned Christianity from the apostles, and they being taught in simple and unadorned style, but moved with the incredible sanctity of the messengers sent them by God, inflamed with zeal, persuaded by miracles, and effectually convinced of the truth by the inward illumination of the divine spirit, and fleeing for refuge to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as the only author of salvation, gave up themselves to be led and ruled at his pleasure, as ignorant of subtle disputes, as studious of piety. Then it was that the Christian faith exerted all its influence in the minds of men, and animated them rather bravely to suffer death for Christ than to engage with acrimony in contentions concerning the more obscure points of religion. And hence it is that I have often thought with myself, perhaps those men were the most happy, who, knowing nothing but Jesus Christ and Him crucified, and living soberly, righteously, and godly, according to the prescription of the gospel, did not so much as hear by report concerning the contentions of divines. And I reckon it not the smallest part of our calamity, or at least the most painful of our office, that we who preside in matters of Christianity are often constrained to bestow tedious labour in resolving the difficulties of thorny controversies. So is the age, all places resound with debates, that very temple not accepted which the Lord hath consecrated to peace and concord. And truly it can scarce be otherwise in the profound repose which we in these times enjoy, whatever be its kind in so great a diversity of genius and disposition, in so great an ambition after sublimer science, and finally in so great an itch after innovations. Be ye willing or unwilling, in battle you must engage. Oh, that it were always that good fight of faith which Paul recommended to Timothy. However, if we are not permitted to shun the conflict, the prudence of just demands that they, who in the defence of orthodoxy show themselves the rigid guardians of truth, should remember studiously to avoid these things which are not lawful for the ministers of peace. And hence it is that they especially to whom is committed the preaching of the gospel should endeavour clearly to discern the truths revealed by God, that they may explain them in clear and proper words, and such as are drawn from the fountain of holy scripture, that they seriously rejoice in the harmony of minds and promote it as much as possible in a consistency with truth that in differences they with a judicious lenity approve their equity and modesty to God and to men, that they think humbly concerning themselves and highly of their brethren, not affecting the fame of more exquisite wisdom, but justly esteeming the gifts of God in those who are their neighbours, that they calumniate no man's word, or by cavilling impute opinions to any to which he professes himself averse, Finally, that they reckon it unworthy of the gravity of a divine to strive in an idle and an odious manner concerning the niceties of words, when there is little and almost no difference about the thing itself. If our controversies in the Netherlands, if yours in Britain, brethren, had been treated with such dispositions and in such a way and method, it would have been far better, as well for the public tranquillity as for the truth itself and evangelical piety. But we suffer every one his own punishment, permitted at present to pass by our disputations in silence, with the most penetrating sense of which we are grieved. You yourselves, brethren, would not allow me to be without a part in yours, which perhaps are agitated with too much warmth under the hostile standards of antinomians and neonomians, though both disallow the names. For some of yourselves, the books on both sides being sent me, requested my judgment, inconsiderable as it is to the discovery of which I did not proceed but very slowly and with reluctant steps. For first, in the knowledge of the cause, which was involved in many subtleties and quirks, I had the greatest difficulties to surmount. 
so much the greater that I have scarce a tolerable knowledge of your language. In the next place, not a little labour was to be spent in this, that what I seemed somehow, at least to know in a matter of the greatest intricacy, I should explain in a methodical and perspicuous manner, which I understood to be chiefly necessary. In fine, knowing to measure myself by my own standard, I could not be ignorant, that I was not at all endowed with such wisdom and authority as to be accounted a proper judge in so great a controversy. Nevertheless, since the matter was very much at heart, as being of the utmost importance, I used all diligence to reach that on which the dispute turned, and having found, what had also been observed by John Hornbeek, a man of the utmost integrity and a divine of a cultivated judgment, that it is often seen the difference is less in the thing itself than in the manner of speaking and the method of teaching, I went on with the greater courage, hoping it might happen that the impediments of ambiguity being removed, some controversies might be decided by the mere elucidation of the subject itself, and both contending parties confess that they had understood the same thing, but in a different manner of expression. Besides, I was less afraid of incurring the displeasure of either party, although I assent to neither in all things, that I transferred the whole of the dispute from personal and verbal things unto real, not inquiring, with too much rigour, what was said or unsaid by this or that man, what was well understood or otherwise by the reader or the hearer, but what ought to be said, or, in my judgment at least, may be most conveniently said. It is a very frequent fault with disputants that the one complains of the sense being badly expressed, the other that it is not well understood, whence it is that the whole dispute often evanishes into a mere mistake of the subject, or, which is worse, issues in the most indecent brawlings. I judged that by all means such a conduct should be avoided, applying myself to this alone, that I might clearly deliver the truth without injury to any man, and without party zeal, that offence of which is far from me. Do you, brethren, take in good part this Dutch candour, and despise not the sincere labour of a foreigner, following truth with charity? Besides enjoying the common name of Christians and Protestants, we have the same celestial depositum committed to our care, and we Batavians and Britons are now connected by a straighter bond, living under the pious and happy government of the same best of princes, your king and our stadtholder, William the Third to whom we know there is nothing more desirable than that the monuments of faction being erased as well in Britain as in the Netherlands, right hands should join in the perpetual confederation of brethren. But there is abundance of preface. Let us come to the subject. The Translator's Preface Purity and peace are essential to that wisdom which cometh from above. James 3.17 Accordingly, those endued with it have ever held them in the highest estimation. Begotten by the word of truth, they seek the peace of Jerusalem. By means of the one, they enjoy communion with their God, and in virtue of the other, the pleasures of fellowship amongst themselves. While zealous for the former, they dare not disregard the latter. Enamoured with both, it is as a sword in their bones to see them divided. Their love to the truth, as it is in Jesus, will not suffer them to embrace that peace which rises on its ruins, nor will their love of peace allow them to violate the communion of saints for matters of doubtful disputation. When it is endangered, they are ready to stand in the breach in order to reconcile the contending parties. Such pacific disputations point out whose they are, whom they serve, and whither they are going. Blessed, said the Prince of Peace, are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God, Matthew 5, 9. And while blessed of the Lord, they are generally had in honour among men. In few instances was this ever more verified than in the celebrated Witsius. His learning, his life, his labours, and his steady attachment to evangelic truth endeared him when alive to her friends and embalmed his memory when dead. Hence it was that when several doctrinal differences began to be warmly agitated amongst some ministers in England, they agreed in submitting them to him as an able and impartial umpire. This gave rise to his ironical animadversions. They were first printed at Utrecht, anno 1696, in a small octavo of 237 pages, and four years after at Amsterdam, in the second volume of the author's miscellanies. But the seventh and eighth chapters of the Utrecht edition were omitted in that of Amsterdam. For what reason I have not been able to learn. They seemed to me, however, of too much importance to be overlooked in this translation. The late holy Hervey, in a footnote in his Theron and Aspasio, Volume 2, page 366, 
referring to the Utrecht edition of these animate versions, expresses himself in the following words, Si vitsi anima diversiones irenicae, chapter 8, a choice little piece of polemical divinity, perhaps the very best that is extant, in which the most important controversies are fairly stated, accurately discussed, and judiciously determined, with a perspicuity of sense and a solidarity of reasoning, exceeded by nothing but the remarkable conciseness and the still more remarkable candour of the sentiments. Having often read these animate versions, and found with pleasure that they were well entitled to all the character which Hervey had given them, I judged it might be of advantage to the truth to clothe them in an English dress. How far I have succeeded in doing justice to the original belongs to others to determine. This, however, I can aver that in no instance have the author's sentiments been willingly misrepresented. Such as are not strangers in our Israel will easily perceive that the topics insisted on here coincide in a great measure with those in The Marrow of Modern Divinity, a book recommended by the Venerable Hogg of Charnock, condemned by the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland, anno 1720, vindicated by the Twelve Brethren, and long supported by the whole body of the secession. Having stripped our author's little volume of its Latin dress, I deemed it necessary to add some notes for the further elucidation of gospel truth. But these swelling to a far greater size than was at first intended, it seemed more proper to give them by themselves than along with the translation. By this method the reader is no ways interrupted in perusing the author, nor his eye and attention every now and then called off by footnotes. These will be more properly consulted on a second reading of the animate versions than at the first. In some instances I have adventured to differ from our very venerable author, but these not affecting the substance of the doctrine, nor the power of godliness, need create no uneasiness to the reader. And indeed, if such differences be not allowed, church communion is at an end. Absolute unity of views is not to be expected till we reach the land of everlasting light. While we know but in part we must differ in some punctilios. The reader will, no doubt, observe that I frequently quote the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms. I do indeed, I am not ashamed of doing so. On a solemn occasion, and before many witnesses, I acknowledged that confession to be the confession of my faith, and hitherto I have seen no reason either to renounce or to refine it. These fifty years I have been acquainted with it, and the catechisms, I bless the God of truth that I have." Finding that my sentiments agree with them, I have the pleasure to see that I am going forth by the footsteps of the flock, which is certainly as safe and much more comfortable than to walk in an untrodden path. Though not within the pale of the established church, but sitting under the shade of toleration, I am far from thinking that all legal establishments are improper or unwarrantable. I cannot yet be persuaded that because error has no right to such an establishment, neither has truth. This would be saying, in effect, that as Jeroboam sinned in setting up the calves, 1 Kings 12, 26-33, so did Jehoshaphat, Cyrus, and Artaxerxes in supporting the true worship of God, 2 Chronicles 19, 5-11, Ezra 11, 11, 7, 11 28 or that because kings sin against God in giving their power and strength unto the beast, Revelation 17, 13, they do the same in being nursing fathers unto Zion, Isaiah 44, Alt, 45, 1 to 6, 49, 23, 40, 16, Revelation 21, 24. When I left the Church of Scotland, it was not because she was established by law, but because of her tyranny in government and her error in doctrine. Witness the many violent settlements which take place, and the barefaced Arminianism, to say nothing worse, which is taught almost everywhere. I did not leave her because she had a confession of faith, but because she abode not by it. Many of her members, in direct violation of their ordination vows, teaching doctrines contrary to it. Her confession and catechisms I account as the ancient landmarks which our fathers set, and hope never to see them removed. Proverbs 22.28 Our fathers, it is urged, were not infallible. True, and as little are their sons. It is one thing to say they could not err, another that they did not err in compiling these sacred systems. It is surely one thing to affirm that an arithmetician is infallible, another to aver that he commits no mistake in calling twelve times twelve an hundred and forty-four. If any credit be due to Dr. Manton's testimony, who was contemporary with the compilers of our confession and catechisms, quote, 
they were a synod of as godly judicious divines as ever england saw and if in the days of old they had had but such a council of bishops as these of presbyters was the fame of it for learning and holiness and all ministerial abilities would with very great honour have been transmitted to posterity End quote. enemies to confessions declaim aloud that they are a restraint upon free inquiry after the truth and fetter the minds of men it is granted that the principles in the confession adopted by a church are not to be called in question by her members this is after vows to make inquiry proverbs twenty twenty five what an absurdity to be ever and anon raising doubts concerning things which they confess this would be to pull down with the one hand what they build with the other as if builders should use battering rams to try the strength of those very walls which their own hands had reared what we have we must hold fast revelation two twenty five at the same time it is cheerfully granted that if anything in said confession be found not to be agreeable to scripture that church which adopted it is bound to reject it and such as love the truth readily will the same reverence for scripture which made them at first receive it will now cause them to renounce it they embraced it as agreeable to scripture but now discovering that it is not they can adhere no longer to it this however does not annihilate the use of confessions for though much of the scripture is yet unexplored and there are many things of which we can only say we think they are true there are others of which we can boldly affirm they are true and of the utmost importance there are doctrines which if any man deny we are neither to receive him nor bid him god speed to john verse ten a heretic is to be rejected after the first and second admonition titus three ten two peter two one sure as truth is one we are certain that what we already know can never be contrary to what we do not yet know what though at last the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun and that of the sun sevenfold as the light of seven days isaiah thirty twenty six this militates nothing against our embracing and professing what we know to be truth because the light shall then be greater we are not therefore to shut our eyes against that with which we are favoured at present whatever accessions shall be made to the edifice of known truth we may rest confident that they shall bear no prejudice to those truths which from generation to generation have been the joy of the saints the precious stones then brought forth shall not raise but rest on the foundation laid in zion long ago the greater accession of light shall not destroy the less that these mites cast into the treasury of truth may be accepted of god and advantageous to his church is the fervent prayer of thomas bell glasgow end of preface Chapter 1 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animate Versions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning the Translation of Sin to Christ. These things which use now to be chiefly controverted may be reduced to six principal heads. For there is a dispute, one, concerning the way and manner of obtaining salvation, two, concerning the application of the purchased salvation, three, concerning justification, four, concerning the nature and genius of the covenant of grace, five, concerning the utility of holiness and good works, six, concerning the preaching of the law and the gospel, under which general heads are comprehended many particular controversies to be distinctly explained. Concerning the purchase of salvation, these things are chiefly the subjects of inquiry. 1. Whether only the punishment due to the sins of the elect, or the very sins of the elect, both as to their stain and as to their guilt, are translated to Christ as surety. 2 whether Christ, on account of that translation, was and ought to be called as great a sinner as the elect themselves, yea, the greatest of all sinners. 3. Whether by the suretyship of Christ there be a certain exchange of persons between him and the elect. 4. Whether the translation of sins to Christ and his carrying them began in his crucifixion and terminated in his resurrection from the dead. 5. Whether at that time when he chiefly carried the sins of the elect, he was separated from God, was odious and abominable to him, and whether God did then abdicate his son, 
and again acknowledge him for his son when he raised him from the dead. 6. Whether Christ, by taking upon him the sins of the elect and satisfying divine justice, absolutely purchased eternal salvation for them, or this only that they could be saved, and in reality should if they believe. These questions I shall so prosecute in order that what I judge should be determined as to each may be explained in the clearest manner. And I choose to begin with the origin of salvation. The ever-blessed and the great God determined from eternity to render himself glorious and wonderful in delivering certain men, designed, as by name, from sin and death, and in their eternal salvation, salvation to be acquired by his only begotten Son, to whom he hath life in himself, he has also given to have life in himself and to be applied by the spirit of life. Since God is entirely independent in all the acts of his will and the supreme ruler of all things and persons, and likewise the only author of all good and therefore of all faith, virtue and holiness in men, the favour of which things he most freely confers on whom he pleaseth, doing all things according to the counsel of his will, no faith, no virtue, nay, no good at all could be foreknown in some men more than in others, in consideration of which he should choose the one rather than the other. But all the reason of this difference is to be placed in the absolute dominion of God, and in the immense freedom of glorious grace concerning which he is accountable to none. And since the counsel of Jehovah standeth for ever, since established in unsearchable wisdom by a God who knows not to repent, it has the inconceivable power of omnipotence subservient to it, to bend the minds of men whithersoever it will, without any prejudice to rational liberty. It is absolutely impossible that they should not be saved, whom God hath appointed to obtain salvation. That he might execute this purpose, not only without diminishing or obscuring in the least any of his attributes, but also in the clearest demonstration of them, he most wisely determined in the same eternal decree to give for a saviour to those elect, his only co-eternal and co-equal son, who in the appointed time should assume the nature of man, the form of a servant, and represent them as a surety or undertaker for them, should by the most exact obedience of his life and the meritorious suffering of his death satisfy the divine majesty and justice, injured by the sins of men and victorious over all sufferings and death itself, should be constituted the head of the elect in eternal glory. Further, since the will of the Son is the same with that of the Father, he voluntarily offered himself, from eternity, to undertake and perform that suretyship for the elect. And in this consent of will, there is some resemblance as of a mutual compact or covenant. By virtue of this covenant, God laid all the sins of all the elect upon his Son, whom he called Jesus Christ. I say sins, for so the scripture everywhere speaks. Isaiah 53, 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord made the iniquity of us all to rush upon him. And again, verse 11, And he shall bear their iniquities. And again, verse 12, And he bare the sin of many. Add 1 Peter 1, 24, who his own self bare our sins in his own body. This was typically prefigured of old by the laying on of hands and of sins upon the beast destined to be a sacrifice instead of the sinner. For it was the end of that ceremony to signify that sin was taken away from the men who offered and translated to the sacrifice. Hence the sacrifice itself was called sin and guilt. Nay, the sacrifice was reckoned to be so polluted by the sin laid upon it that even they who were employed in the sacred ministry concerning it were defiled by touching it. For so it happened not only to him who led the peculiar goat into the wilderness, Leviticus 16.26, but also to those who attended the red heifer and the goats burnt without the camp, Numbers 19.7 and 8, Leviticus 16.28. So the priests who feasted on such sacrifices were reckoned to bear the iniquity of the congregation because they converted part of their substance into their own. There is no doubt, but these things should be referred to Christ Jesus, of whom it is said, Isaiah 53.10, If his soul shall make itself to be sin, or the speech being directed to God, if thou, Lord, shalt make his soul to be sin. To the same purpose, Paul, 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, who had not known sin, to be sin for us. That is, as the innocent victim, without spot and blemish, became sin and mere guilt, 
by a vicarious substitution, when God, who was to be satisfied, pleased that the substitution should take place, so also God substituted Christ, most holy in himself and free from all personal sin, in the place of the offenders, and made him sin, that is, a sacrifice for sin, that he might truly bear sin and satisfy for it, as the sacrifice did in a typical manner. Nay, God so refers the sin of the elect to Christ's account, that, however remote from him, yet they are called his sins. For thus he himself speaks of the matter, Psalm 69, 4 and 5, That which I took not away I will restore, O God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not hid from thee. I suppose that this psalm contains a prayer of Christ the Lord, which appears from the quotation of its various parts in the New Testament. He complains of his sufferings and of the insolence of his most unjust enemies, and protests that he had not brought this calamity upon himself by his own fault, but that he had paid what he had not taken away, which robbery, however, he immediately calls his sin, because he sustained the character of surety. As if he should say, It is true, my God, that I have come under guilt and am made a curse, but thou knowest all the sins, even to the smallest faults for which I satisfy, and that in all these sins and in all these follies which I call mine in respect of suretyship, none of them is my own personal offence by which I violated thy right, that I should restore what I had taken away. In like manner Paul teaches that in Psalm 40 Christ is introduced as speaking, now the person whose speech that psalm exhibits thus begins in the twelfth verse, Mine iniquities take hold upon me, so that I am not able to look up. Further, this imputation of our sins to Christ is to be understood, that by it no prejudice is done either to the truth of the divine judgment, or to Christ's untainted holiness. For God does not so impute our sins to him as to judge that he hath committed what we have done, that he was made drunk when Noah quenched himself with wine, committed incest with Lot or adultery with David, which thought is so far inconsistent with all reason that I can scarcely believe it could ever enter the mind of any man of sense, much less of a Christian or one who fears God. We know that every judgment of God is according to truth. Now it is most false that Christ committed what was committed by the elect. Neither are our sins ever so reckoned to be his, but that he always remains holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. However, since by virtue of that covenant of which I spake above, Christ, as well by his own will as by that of the Father, became the surety of the elect, and in the judgment of God represents and sustains their person, their sins are so far imputed to him, and said to be his by imputation, one, that he is no less bound to pay than if he himself, which God forbid, had perpetrated them in his own person. When God judgeth so, he judgeth according to truth, and that judgment is found on the eternal and most holy will of the Father and the Son. Further, in sin, the stain and the guilt are to be distinctly considered. How the sins of the elect are imputed to Christ in respect of guilt is, if I am not mistaken, easily understood from what has already been said. Nay, I think it also obvious that their sins are by no means imputed to him as to their stain in that sense, that by that imputation he is anyhow physically polluted, or rather morally, if you will, at least inherently, but so far that he is so treated by God as if he occupied the place and represented the person of the filthy and the unclean, and on that account his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men, Isaiah 53.14 in which sense Gregory of Nyssa said well that Christ bore the stain of our sins. Both may be said in a sound sense, viz. that our sins, as many of us are elect, are ours, not Christ's, and that the same sins are Christ's and no more ours. They are ours because committed by us, and because by them we brought upon ourselves the guilt of eternal death, and thus far they will remain ours forever, that is, it will be always true that we committed them, and in so doing, deserved the wrath of God. For what is done can never become undone, and thus they are not Christ's, because he did not commit them, neither did he contract any personal guilt. Neither could they become his sins, because the nature of things does not suffer that the same numerical act which was committed by us should be done by Christ. But the sins which we committed became Christ's when imputed to him as surety, and he, on account of his suretyship, took them upon him, that in the most free and holy manner he might satisfy for them, and they ceased to be ours. 
inasmuch as for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, we neither ought nor can in the judgment of God be brought to condemnation or satisfaction in our own person on their account. And these things seem so evident to me that there can be no difference as to the matter itself among the orthodox. Since they are so, I know not why some should incline rather to say that the punishment or guilt of our sins were translated to Christ than the sins themselves as to their guilt. Since the last is said by Scripture itself, a wish to soften its most pure, most wise, and most emphatic phrases by I know not what smoother ones of our own, is the part of a mind delicate to a fault, and not duly esteeming the wisdom of sacred scripture. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animate Versions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whether Christ can with propriety be called a sinner, an adulterer, an idolater, etc., and whether a certain exchange of persons took place between him and the elect. But on the other hand, I think it is neither good nor prudent that others go farther than is just, use too hard expressions, and such as are unknown to the Holy Spirit, which can scarcely but offend tender ears. For instance, when they say that we are not greater sinners than Christ, who being made sin for us was as great a sinner as we, that our sins were so actually translated to Christ that we are no more sinners, that as often as an elect person is spoken of, although he hath committed adultery, theft, and idolatry, he is not the adulterer, the thief, or idolater, but that these are rather to be affirmed of Christ, that there was never so great a transgressor on earth as Christ, and more of that nature. These things are without scripture, which indeed calls Christ sin, never a sinner. Neither indeed do I agree with those who think that by that abstract and hyperbolical phrase, as they say, the force of the concrete is intended, that it is more to say sin than a sinner. Paul, as usual, borrows these his phrases from the Old Testament, and treating of our reconciliation with God by the expiatory sacrifice of Christ, he teaches that Christ was such a sacrifice in truth as the Chet and Hashem were in type, as I have just now shown. But neither does the prophet call Christ a sinner when he testifies that he was numbered with transgressors, Isaiah 53.12, for that may be very conveniently referred to the unjust judgment of the most wicked men procuring the death of Christ. This prophecy had its accomplishment when Christ, being apprehended as a robber, accused of deceiving, of blasphemy, and of disturbing the commonwealth, was at last crucified. In the midst between two thieves, we have Mark, at least, as the author of this interpretation, chapter 15, verse 28. But in reality, although they do not speak with Scripture, who love to call Christ a sinner, truly a sinner, the greatest of all sinners, and although I judge it better to abstain from phrases so hard and so liable to calumny, yet since other authors solicitously provide for the untainted purity of Christ, and mean that none of them be understood except in respect of our sins, which are not Christ's, unless by the imputation of God the Father, and his own most holy undertaking, neither have they any other aim except to show that the imputation is most full, and every way good in law for our salvation. I am unwilling that that should be snatched by the left hand which is given to the right, and that unusual expressions should be seized as materials for calumny. For they also have the greatest examples by which they can defend themselves. Chrysostom, homily 11, on the second to the Corinthians, ton har dekion fesin, epuesen, Amadolon inatus amartolus puese dikeus, malone ude utos ipen, al o polo mison en, uhar esin etheken, al aften ten puateta, uhar ipen, e puese amartolon, al amartian ina emis genometha, ug ipe dikeu, ala dikea sune, ke for, says he, he made the righteous a sinner, that he might make sinners righteous. Yea, he spake not only so, but something which was much greater, for he did not suppose the habit, but the quality itself. 
for he did not say he made him a sinner, but sin, that we might be made. He did not say righteous, but righteousness, and even the righteousness of God. Add Ucomenius on chapter 9 to the Hebrews, page 845. Christ was a great sinner, inasmuch as he had taken upon him the sins of the whole world, and had made them his own. Calvin, on Galatians 3.13, follows those fathers, but modestly. Because he represented our person, therefore he was a sinner, and obnoxious to the curse, not so much in himself, indeed, as in us, but yet that he was under a necessity to pay our debt. And in Malarat's collections, on 2 Corinthians 5.21, I find the following expressions. Christ not only died for us, but he died as a cursed by God, and the most wicked sinner of all. But most plainly, James Alingus, Dissertation Theology, Hept 2, Dis 1, Section 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that Christ came into judgment and was condemned there, yet is declared impious, or an offender, appears from this, that imprisonment is joined with judgment, Isaiah 53, 8, by which judgment he was brought into prison. That judgment was not human, which may be unjust, but divine, and therefore most just. Now since in the divine judgment Christ was condemned to that prison, verily he must needs have been guilty and an offender, since injustice neither belongs nor can belong to God the judge, under which, however, he would have laboured, if indeed he had condemned the just and the innocent. Now Christ was impious and an offender, not absolutely but relatively, as a surety, who, free of personal debt, sustains the guilt of another, and on this account is guilty, an offender or impious in the sight of the creditor and judge. Though I do not altogether approve of these phrases, yet I must maintain that Christ so substituted himself for the elect and sustained their person, that a certain exchange of persons takes place. And as Christ represented their person, while he took their debts upon him, and paid for them no less than if he himself had been bound to pay, so they again are judged to have paid in the surety, no less than if they had paid in their own person. For I believe none acquainted with divinity has ever been found, nay, not indeed a man of sound judgment, who dreamed of such an exchange of persons, whereby either the Saviour was reduced to the rank of them who are to be saved, or they become the Saviour. That would be as extravagant as what I say is orthodox, because, as Christ representing the person of the elect was made sin for them, so also, on the other hand, the elect considered in the person of Christ become the righteousness of God in him, and because his righteousness is as much their righteousness as their sins were his sins, both by imputation, but an imputation so valid that, as he could not but be punished on account of their sins imputed to him, so they cannot but be saved on account of his righteousness imputed to them. These things, as to the matter itself, seem to me so certain and solid, yea, and such fundamental mysteries of faith, that they ought to be uncontroverted among all the orthodox. It is not ours to contend concerning the niceties of words. This exchange of persons, Justin Martyr extolled in lofty language in his epistle to Diognetus. The alo das amartia semon edunce calupse e equinon sunen. Ente dikiosune dunaton tus anomus emas que asethis e ento uio tu theu, o tes glucias catalages, o tes anexignisatu de misurgias, o ton aprosdoceton evergesion ina anomia polon en dikio en cruce dikiosunen de Eos polus an mus digiose. What else could cover our sins but his righteousness? In whom else could we, the unjust and the impious, be accounted righteous but in the Son of God only? O oh, the sweet exchange, O oh, the unsearchable contrivance, O oh, the unexpected benefits, that the iniquity of many should be hid in a righteous one, and that the righteousness of one should justify many who were unjust. These things are prosecuted excellently and at large by Tariton in The Truth of Christ's Satisfaction, Part 2, Section 34. Neither do I think it will be disagreeable to any if his words be here recited. As we are said to be made righteousness in Christ by imputation, because on account of the righteousness of Christ, apprehended by us through faith and imputed by God, we are pronounced righteous before him, 
so, in like manner, that the nature of the opposition may appear, he was made sin for us by imputation, because our guilt, wherewith we were bound in the judgment of God, was laid up on him as our surety, that he might suffer the punishment due to it. Augustine expresses himself most excellently in his Enchiridion to Laurentius, chapter 41. He sin and we righteousness, not our own but God's, not in ourselves but in him. As he was made sin, not his own but ours, not in himself but in us. Thus indeed, by a wonderful exchange, he took our evils upon himself, that he might bestow his benefits upon us, received misery that he might grant mercy, received the curse that he might make us partakers of the blessing, received death that he might confer life, received sin that he might impart righteousness. This exchange on both sides agrees in the following things. First, that in both, something foreign is, by the estimation of the divine judgment, transferred to a person, which translation is not an error of judgment, but a certain appointment, whereby, on account of something done by another, something is assigned to thee, as if thou hadst been that very person from whom that action arose. On account of our sin, death was inflicted on Christ, as if he himself had sinned, and because of Christ's righteousness, life and the inheritance are conferred on us, as if we had been righteous and had fulfilled the law. Further, that on both sides there behoved to be a connection between these persons, for our sins could not have been imputed to Christ unless he had been united to us, both by the bond of the same nature and a voluntary suretyship, neither could his righteousness have been imputed to us unless we had become one body with him. Yet they differ far in this, that the imputation to Christ is according to justice, to us according to mercy. Sin was translated to him, but to be abolished, righteousness to us, but to be preserved. The curse to him in order to be swallowed up, the blessing to us with a view to be continued, pollutions to him that they might be cast into the depths of the sea, the new robe of the firstborn to us that it might be put on. Hence it is that we can be called truly righteous and the sons of God, but Christ cannot therefore be called either a sinner or a son of wrath, because he neither had sin of himself, nor did the wrath of God abide on him, but only passed over him. So far Turretin, to which things expressed with equal solidity and elegance I subscribe with heart and hand. After I had thus written, conciliatory letters were sent me from London, wherein to my great joy I found things which I think highly calculated to restore harmony among brethren. Some had been justly offended with that inconsiderate assertion that there is no exchange of persons between Christ and believers. That stumbling block the reconcilers take out of the way by this declaration. Since we conceive that the doctrine of justification and of the satisfaction of Christ, upon which it depends, cannot be duly explained and defended if the exchange of persons between Christ and believers be denied, therefore we declare that we disapprove of that proposition in its general sense, and explain our mind as follows. It is clear that there cannot be a physical exchange whereby Christ and believers are converted into one another according to substance, nor moral whereby Christ becomes inherently wicked and infected with the stain of sin and believers become immediately innocent, harmless and undefiled. But in reality we do not doubt, but there is an exchange of persons in a legal sense, so that Christ, by virtue of the covenant between the Father and Him, took upon Him the person and came in the place and stead of sinners. Not that we might repent and believe for them which is required in the gospel, although he obtained that the elect should at the appointed time be rendered fit for these things, but that for them he might satisfy the violated obligation of the law of works. He was made sin for them, although he had not known sin, that they might be made the righteousness of God in him. And what is repugnant to this exposition we judge to be erroneous and false. Thus far the learned men, and what impartial person can desire more. End of chapter 2Chapter 3 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Hermann Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When the translation of sin to Christ, and his bearing it commenced and ended, and whether, when carrying the sins of the elect, he was separated from God, abominable to him, and abdicated by him. Let us now inquire, in the third place, whether the translation of sins to Christ, and his bearing them, began at his crucifixion, and ended in his resurrection from the dead. To which question I answer thus, 
the translation of our sins to Christ may be considered two ways, either as in the decree, and then it imports nothing else but the certainty of that event which should take place at the appointed time, or as in the execution, which began when the Son of God, having assumed the nature of man and the form of a servant, was in such a state that he could actually satisfy divine justice for the elect. The very assumption of human nature was an acknowledging the debt of our sins, which the Son of God had taken upon him, and the handwriting was sealed with the blood of his circumcision. All that form of a servant, and the likeness of sinful flesh, which, continuing from the beginning of Christ's life even unto death, is an evidence of sin translated to him. For all that time which he passed in a mean and an abject state, he was never seen without sin, as Paul speaks, Hebrews 9.28. And in that meanness and misery, there was not only a confession of debt, but also a part of satisfaction. For as the death which God threatened to man, who was soon to sin, comprehends those miseries to which the sinner is obnoxious through the whole of life, and which are some part, at least, of the curse lying upon him. So it was just that Christ, in order to the payment of the debt which he had taken upon him, should pass a life obnoxious to many miseries, such as that of the sinner is. Now, as God exerciseth much long-suffering towards sinners, until the day of wrath and of just retribution come, when all the weight of his curse shall lie upon the damned. In like manner, neither was Christ in his servile state always so pressed with the weight of sins lying on him, but that now and then he was refreshed with a remarkable sense of the divine favor, till the hour and the power of darkness came, when being called to judgment he underwent the most terrible things. Then chiefly was our iniquity exacted, then most of all was Christ afflicted, then the satisfaction was perfect to the uttermost farthing. To say it in a word, as all miseries taken together are the debt of sin, so also Christ, to whom all the debt of the elect was translated, while he spent a life liable to miseries, which were most grievous at death, by all those miseries taken together, and by a cursed death itself he satisfied divine justice so that all these taken in cumulo make up the payment which was due for our sins. Therefore, they begin too late and lengthen the time too much in which our sins lay upon Christ, who make it to commence with the cross and to terminate in the resurrection. For elsewhere I have largely proved that those pains which he suffered in his body and soul prior to his crucifixion belonged to the punishment of our sins, and that in them there was a demonstration of divine wrath. But that after death he remained still loaded and deformed with our sins does not agree with the celebrated saying, It is finished nor with Paul's doctrine, who asserts that the handwriting which was against us was nailed to the cross, and so taken away, and that Christ, having spoiled hostile principalities and powers, and made a show of them openly, triumphed over them by his cross, Colossians 2.14. Nor in fine, with other arguments of learned men, to be examined by and by. For it cannot be conceived how Christ was forsaken of God, cast off and abominable to him, when the Father kindly embraced his spirit and received it into heaven, and considered his body lying in the grave as the body of his Holy One, loving him and beloved by him. Hence his flesh did rest in hope. Psalm 16, 9 and 10. For I see that it is also disputed in the fourth place whether Christ, during all that time, in which he chiefly bore our sins, was separated from God and God from him, whether on account of the pollution of sins which were translated to him, he was odious and abominable to God, whether God at that time did abdicate him and again acknowledge him for a son when he raised him from the dead. To speak candidly, the matter appears to me in the following light, viz., that, what is unusual and hard in these words, which their author, by a singular turn of mind, pursues, and in which he delights, strikes such horror into the hearers, that they are astonished at the unexpected speech, that they cannot weigh the thing itself in an even balance. But without being unhinged by passion I shall attempt it. And as to the first, since they agree in this, that at no time the personal union was dissolved, 
both confessing with the council of Chalcedon that it was indissoluble and perpetual, and meanwhile, since it appears that the Son was forsaken of the Father, then far from his salvation, and from the words of his roaring, Psalm 22, 1, namely as to the present influences of exhilarating and comforting grace, yet so that God did not cease by his almighty power to support the suffering humanity, otherwise unequal to bear the weight of the dreadful curse. Truly I do not see what ground of controversy can remain. Unless this perhaps, whether during all the time of his extreme sufferings, Christ's soul was refreshed with no sense of comforting grace, which indeed I dare not say. He truly bore our sins when in the garden he began to be troubled, and to be sore amazed, and to be sorrowful even unto death, and yet at that very time he had an angel sent from heaven to strengthen him, while he exposed his body to the smiters, and his cheeks to them that plucked off the hair, while he hid not his face from shame and spitting, he found that the Lord was his helper. Therefore he set his face like a flint, because he knew that he should not be ashamed, he being near who would justify him. Isaiah 50, 6, 7, and 8. Neither does it seem probable that even on the cross the mind of Christ was always so intensely fixed on the divine wrath against our sins that faith did not now and then represent to him what an acceptable sacrifice he would offer to his Father and what a glorious reward he would obtain to himself and to his elect, after the greatest torments indeed, but of a very short duration. Truly that thought could not but greatly comfort his soul, so deeply plunged in sorrow. And I judge that Paul intended this when exhorting the Hebrews to run with patience the race set before them, and with that faith which believes that God is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him, he sets the example of the Lord before their eyes. Looking, he says, unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross, Hebrews 12.2, that is, by the view and the expectation of the joy promised to him, he was remarkably encouraged to endure the cross, yea, and in enduring it. And which is more, in that very moment wherein Jesus complained that he was forsaken, he recalled to memory that God was his strong God, his God in covenant, certain that by the strength of his God he should be supported, certain that all the promises of the covenant should be yea and amen to him and to his people. Let us now come to the other head of inquiry, whether it be proper to say that Christ, on account of the pollution of our sins, was also polluted and odious, and placed in such a state that God abhorred him. Where, again, it is without controversy that Christ, because of his most perfect holiness, was always most acceptable to God the Father, and most beloved by him. And it is so far from being true that by the voluntary susception of our sins, the love of God to him was anyhow diminished, that, on the contrary, he never pleased the Father more than when he showed himself obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. For this is that excellent, that incomparable, and almost incredible obedience which the Father recompensed with a suitable reward of ineffable glory. Nay, it is also confessed on both sides that Christ, not because of the susception of our sins, which was a holy action, and most acceptable to God, but because of the sins themselves which he took upon him, and because of the persons of sinners whom he sustained, was represented not only under the emblem of a lamb, inasmuch as it is a stupid kind of creature, and ready to wander, but also of a levitious, a wanton, and a rank-smelling goat, Leviticus 16.7, yea, likewise of a cursed serpent, John 3.14, and in that respect, was execrable and accursed even to God. For this is what Paul expressly asserts, Galatians 3.13, on which place Calvin thus comments. He does not say that Christ was cursed, but a curse, which is more, for it signifies that the curse due to all terminated in him. If this seem hard to any, let him also be ashamed of the cross of Christ, in the confession of which we glory. Some of the Romish doctors have, with great acrimony of style, aggravated what was said by Calvin in the tenth section of his catechism concerning the satisfactory pains and punishment of Christ, viz. that he was in a state of damnation. But it is answered by our divines that Tertullian used the same phrase, Book 3, against Marcion. Chapter 11. The nativity will not be more shameful than death, nor infamy than the cross, nor damnation than the flesh. 
Cyprian on the Passion of Christ, he was damned that he might deliver the damned. And Gregory the Great, Morals, Book 3, Chapter 11, he who is equal to the Father in point of divinity came on our account to scourging in respect of the flesh, which scourging he would not have received had he not in redemption taken upon him the form of a damned man. Since, therefore, the Apostle expressed this truth in the most emphatic words, I know not why a desire should seize any of ours, either of substituting or of adding others to them, or of using them oftener, perhaps, than even Paul's. For what cogent reason is there why we should say that Christ was odious and abominable to the Father, when we may adhere to the dictates of the Holy Spirit, who pronounces that he was an execration of God? But I would wish also to know what there is in these words of human invention, except that they are of human invention, for the sake of which others are so much offended. If we love the thing itself, is there more of emphasis or of weight in the names filthy, odious, abominable, than in the name cursed or execrable? Why do we strive about words which may be safely omitted, if found to give offence, but being also innocently said, ought not to be wrested to another sense? The conciliatory letter I lately mentioned seems to have found out a convenient method of agreement in the following words. Since there is an exchange of persons between Christ and believers, and since the guilt of our iniquities was laid upon him, the Father was offended and angry with him. Not that he was ever moved with any passion against him, which is repugnant in general to the perfection of the divine nature under whatever consideration, neither that he was by any means offended at him, much less abhorred him, so far as he was considered in himself, for so he was entirely free from all sin, but as considered in relation to us, seeing he was our surety, carried our sins in his own body. Thus, if by an offended and an angry mind you understand a holy will to punish, Christ the Lord felt and bore the displeasure of God and the weight of his wrath in the punishment of our sins which were translated to him. For it pleased the Father to bruise him, having laid the iniquities of us all upon him. If these things are granted on both sides, as is just, what controversy can remain? There is more difficulty in the abdication of the Son of God, as they call it, continuing even to his resurrection from the dead. For nowhere in sacred scripture do I find this phrase or any other equivalent to it. Concerning it, certainly, it is not inquired whether the eternal Son of God ceased to be the Son of God while he carried our sins. Let him be anathema who teaches this. But neither is it inquired whether or not the Father then assumed the character of a judge by whom the mediator Christ sustaining the person of rebellious servants, should as such be most severely treated. For this also is an uncontested truth. Perhaps that may be inquired whether God, when he assumed the character of a judge towards Christ, so laid aside the character of a father, that he considered and punished him only as guilty, setting aside the consideration that the guilty person was his own most innocent son. In which controversy the negative part is, in my judgment, better than the affirmative. For as Christ, in the utmost extremity of anguish, acknowledged the judge to be his father, so also God the judge owned him to be his son, for these mutually follow one another. Now Christ, with an ingemination and a singular affection, cried, Abba, Father, and hanging on the cross, he commended his spirit into the Father's hands. And it was of paternal affection, as I also lately hinted, that he sent an angel to comfort him, which certainly will not be the lot of reprobates that he gave him occasion to say, when he was most poor and needy, Indeed I am such, but the Lord thinketh upon me. Psalm forty eighteen, And finally, that he received the departing soul into his own habitation. I see indeed it is alleged for this purpose that Paul refers the words of the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee, to the resurrection of Christ, Acts 13.33, as if God in the resurrection of Christ had, as it were, again begotten his son, and as if his sonship, destroyed by death, had been renewed by the resurrection. But these words have a very different sense. By the resurrection it was indeed declared that Christ is the Son of God with power, not only because appearing alive again by his own power, he proved that he has life in himself, but also because the Father, by raising him, absolved him from the blasphemy wherewith he was charged, for claiming to himself the dignity of the Son of God. In fine, because 
Then the form of a servant was laid aside, whereby the glory as of the only begotten of the Father had hitherto been much obscured, and his equality to God had not been evident to all. But if we properly attend, Paul has another point of view. Acts 13.33 he does not prove the resurrection of Christ from the second psalm, but from Isaiah 55.3 and Psalm 16.10, while verse 34 thus begins, But that he raised him from the dead, etc. He said on this wise, etc. Accurately speaking, Paul's meaning is this, that the promise made to the fathers, God fulfilled to their children, Jesus being raised, that is, exhibited in the flesh, for the same phrase has this signification elsewhere. Acts 2.30, 3.26, Now who he is, whom God promised to exhibit, may be collected from Psalm 2, where he promises to the church that he would give her a king who should be his son, being begotten in a singular manner from eternity. It appears, therefore, that the allegation does not at all belong to this controversy. I am unwilling, however, according to my candor, to conceal that there is another thing which may somehow, and that only so, be referred to this head. The scripture speaking of Christ's being taken up into the heavens frequently uses the word analepsios, Luke 9.51, Mark 16.19, Acts 1, 2 and 22, 1 Timothy 3.16. Now, analamsanin, as Budaeus observed, is to resume and analamphanin ton peda in Demosthenes against Nerea is opposed to to apocrypti, as amongst the Latins the recognizing of children is contrary to abdication. He therefore thinks that analempsin signifies the acknowledging of Christ formally abdicated as it were by the Father. Beza rejects this as an empty trifle, but Kloppenburg commends it, and long ago I profess that I most cordially embraced it, in regard that it both agrees with the genius of the language, and exhibits an useful doctrine. The Son was sent by the Father into this lower world to accomplish the work of redemption, in the form of a servant in a fashion so base and abject, that he seemed rather a worm than a man, much less the most glorious Son of God, except that now and then some rays of divinity shone forth, but in his exaltation to celestial glory the Father declared before all that he acknowledged him for his Son, and meant that he should be adorned with honour befitting so great a name. But these things do not import such or so rigid an abdication as learned men urge, which, beginning with his crucifixion, ceased precisely at his resurrection. I know not whether that stubbornness of style wherein they delight in explaining the sufferings of Christ arises from this, that they think he was so substituted for sinners, that he behoved to undergo precisely the same punishment which was otherwise due to our sins, and which the damned shall suffer in their own persons." which opinion Owen defends at large in his Prolegomena to the Hebrews, volume 2, page 80, etc. I profess truly that I agree with those divines who believe that the Father demanded from the Son a sufficient ransom indeed, and worthy of his injured majesty, yet so that all clemency was not excluded, nor was everything found in Christ's sufferings which shall be found in the most righteous punishment of the reprobates. For from his untainted holiness, from the covenant between him and the Father, finally, from the dignity of his divine person, some things are to be observed in his sufferings which have no place in the eternal misery of the damned. While impious men, roaring and gnashing their teeth and raging with diabolical fury against divine justice, are forced to undergo the punishment inflicted on them, so much the more grievous for this reason that they wretchedly weary themselves in vain resistance, because they are gnawed with the never-dying worm of conscience, continually upbraiding them with their crimes. Christ, from the purest love to the divine glory, voluntarily underwent his afflictions, though most grievous, and with a calm submission to his Father's will, drank the overflowing cup which was mixed to him, and well knowing that nothing befell him on account of his own sins, he enjoyed the serenity of a pure conscience. The rigour of a stubborn law and the peremptory sentence of an inexorable judge, whereby they are condemned to unavoidable and eternal anguish, being continually before the eyes of the wicked, inconceivably increase the terror of their torments through horrible despair. But the sharp-sighted and the steadfast faith of Christ, representing to him ever and anon the Father's most certain promises concerning an inconceivable weight of glory, immediately to follow the most terrible torments indeed, but of short duration, 
encouraged him to bear them with alacrity certain of victory while he was in the most vehement ardour of the combat neither by asserting these things which are most evidently true do we anyhow detract from the value of christ's sufferings which is to be estimated not from their degree only nor from their duration but also from the dignity of the person suffering since in such pains of our divine saviour there is a sufficient ransom and equivalent to the debts of the elect end of chapter three Chapter 4 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whether Christ, by taking upon him the sins of the elect and satisfying divine justice, absolutely purchased eternal salvation for them. I now go on to the fifth controversy, wherein it is inquired what Christ obtained to the elect, that by translation of our sins to him, and by taking them upon himself. The fruits and effects of this matter may be considered in a twofold point of view, either before or after the Saviour bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now it is to be maintained for certain that the efficacy of that translation was so great that it availed also to the redemption of the transgressions which were under the first testament, Hebrews 9.15, and in consideration of it only, as many as from the beginning were saved, obtained salvation. For since God knew that his Son was a faithful surety, and the actual payment was by the most wise counsel of the divine will deferred till the fullness of time, the payment certainly to be availed as much to the salvation of the elect, and to the grace necessary to salvation, as the payment now actually made. And thus far, indeed, if we consider the sum and substance of the thing, as we used to speak, there is no difference in the diversity of times. The believers in the most ancient ages were as much partakers of the same eternal salvation, by virtue of the one satisfaction in Christ, as those who lived after he was perfected. Although if we attend to the grace of this life, according to its extents, its degree, and other circumstances, God provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Hebrews 9.40 Nevertheless, since the saving grace of Christ is taught more largely and explicitly in the gospel of performance than in that of promise, come now, let us see what fruit redounds to the elect from the finished obedience of Christ. And here they by no means obtain my assent, who think that Christ, by taking our sins upon him and satisfying for them, purchased our reconciliation unto God, and therefore eternal life, only upon condition that then only that merit can have its effect in us if we believe, so that the possibility of our salvation is purchased by Christ, but salvation itself remains to be communicated by God as the supreme Lord to whom he thinks fit, and upon what conditions he shall be pleased to prescribe." induced by the authority of sacred scripture, and setting a higher value on the satisfaction of Christ, I thus believe that a right to all the benefits of the testament of grace was purchased at once for all the elect by the satisfaction of Christ, so far that, consistent with his truth and justice, the covenant which he made with his Son remaining firm, God could not adjudge any of the elect to destruction, or exclude them from the possession of salvation." Yea, he hath declared that satisfaction being made by his Son, and accepted by himself, nothing remains for the elect either to suffer or to do, whereby they may procure to themselves immunity from punishment, or a right unto life, but only that every one in their time enjoy the right purchased to them by Christ, and the possession in virtue of that selfsame right. And this is what the Apostle says, 2 Corinthians 5.19, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. That is, when God accepted the oblation of his Son, giving himself up unto death for his people, at the same time he received into favour not only the remnant of Israel, which was according to election, but also all the nations and families of the earth, which otherwise lay in sin, declaring that he was satisfied for their sins, and that after this they should not be imputed to them in order to condemnation, or to their seclusion from his saving grace. It ought not to be doubted but that Christ obtained a right over all the elect, which also the Father cheerfully and deservedly granted him. Psalm 2.8 Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. That is, the reward of Christ's work with his God was that he should not only restore the preserved of Israel, but be the salvation of God even to the end of the earth. 
Isaiah 46, 4 and 6, and that, according to the promise, Isaiah 53, 10, when his soul should make itself an offering for sin, he should see a seed. It is impossible that Christ should not be willing to use that right of his which he so dearly purchased, for why should he not actually claim to himself those whom he bought with so great a price, unless we suppose that he cannot accomplish it without hurting the liberty of the human will? For in reality this rock is known to be the shipwreck of many. But we know that the Spirit of Christ is possessed of such a power to change the heart and soul that he can make those who were formerly the slaves of the devil cheerfully receive Christ for their Lord and cleave to him with the most free and the most constant assent of the will. Let us hear Christ himself. John 10.16 I have also other sheep which are not of this fold, and them I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. Because these sheep were his by right, therefore it behoved him to claim them, in fact. And he knew he could effectuate that by his grace, which maketh willing. They shall hear my voice. It is also to be considered that he is said to have purchased for his elect not only the possibility of the remission of sins, but remission itself. Matthew 26.28, Ephesians 1.7 And not on condition only that they believe, but also the drawing of the Father, and grace that they may believe. Truly, God blesses us with no spiritual blessing except in Christ, Ephesians 1, three. that is, on account of his merits. Now, since the gift of faith is one of the most excellent blessings, Philippians 1.29, it must needs be allotted to us on the same account. He gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, Galatians 1.4. He purchased salvation for the elect, not on condition only that they take a pleasure in the constant study of holiness, but he also purchased sanctification as a part of salvation, necessarily preceding its consummation. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Titus 2.14 Add Ephesians 5.25, 26 and 27 Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify her, that he might present her glorious to himself. But since I have elsewhere professedly prosecuted this subject, suffer thyself, reader, now to be remitted thither, and consult, if you please, the economy of the covenants between God and man. Book 2, chapter 7. End of chapter 4. Chapter 5 of Conciliatory or Ironical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whether the right to the eternal inheritance be applied to the elect at their first nativity or at their regeneration, and whether God imputes no more in point of guilt to an elect person when living in excessive lasciviousness than when he is perfected in the heavens. Concerning the application of the salvation purchased by Christ, the following things are controverted. 1. Whether the right to the eternal inheritance be applied to the elect at their first nativity, and the date of application is to be fixed at their natural generation, whereby they become men, not at their supernatural generation, whereby they become Christians. 2. Whether God imputes no more in point of guilt to the elect, even when living in all the excess of wickedness and lasciviousness, than when after they are truly sanctified, yea, also perfected and received into heaven. 3. Whether the elect are united to Christ before faith. 4. Whether not only the fruits of Christ's righteousness, but also the righteousness itself, be imputed to them, so that by that imputation they become no less righteous and holy than Christ himself. And I trust that these controversies, however great they may seem at first sight, may be decided by the simple and plain declaration of the truth. As to the first, what if we conceive of the matter thus? After Christ satisfied divine justice, God also declared in general that he would never demand satisfaction from any of the elect in their own person, and so a right of immunity was purchased for all the elect at once. But that universal right of all the elect profiteth none in particular till it be applied unto them. No application is made by election as such, for it is an imminent act of God, the proper effect of which is the certainty of the event. 
It is the nature of all the divine decrees that by themselves they make no change in the subject, but all the actual existence of the thing arises from the omnipotent execution of the decree. The execution of the decree is the production of the thing decreed, which is effectuated by virtue of that eternal will whereby God commanded that the thing should exist in that moment of time, the eternal will then only going out into that act whereby the thing exists. Therefore, from election to grace and glory, it only follows that the person so elected is admitted at the appointed time to the participation of both. Before the fullness of the time destined for the execution come, the election of God makes no real change in the person elected, who before his regeneration, as well as all other mortals, is in a present evil world, in the kingdom and power of darkness, dead in trespasses and sins, alienated from the life of God, a child of wrath, even as others, condemned to bondage through fear of death, subject to the curse of the law, a stranger as to the promises of the covenants, without Christ, without God, without hope in the world, as the scripture everywhere speaks. And thus far, there is no actual difference between the elect and the reprobate, except, as was said, that by virtue of God's election, and Christ's satisfaction for the former, they are certainly to be delivered at the appointed time from that miserable state while the latter, for whom salvation is neither appointed by God nor purchased by Christ, shall continue for ever in their deplorable condition. Now the execution of election may be considered two ways. First, in respect of certain external actions, which from the nature of the thing indeed have no certain connection with salvation, and therefore are exercised sometimes even upon the reprobates, yet by the appointment of God, they are directed, as to this person in particular, to promote the work of grace gradually in him. For since God embraces the elect with a love of singular goodwill, to issue at last in a love of complacency, he grants them the means of salvation and causes them to hear the preaching of the gospel, dissuasives from vice, exhortations to the duties of virtue, instruction concerning saving truths, which being somehow perceived by their natural understanding, they fix them in their memory to be profitable afterwards for sanctification, there being added in the meantime some inward illumination of the mind and an exciting of the will to good, although both are in vanid, and not yet saving, but all this with the intention that in their time they may be effectually converted by these means. Since all these things proceed from the counsel of grace, they are likewise justly referred to the execution of election, and since they are the fruits of Christ's merits, they somehow belong to the application of purchased grace, and are, as it were, some of his attempts, who begins to claim to himself what is his own, although they are nothing but some small beginnings of application, whereby the elect are not yet engrafted into Christ. Then there follows a more perfect execution of the election unto grace, and a more solid application of the grace purchased by Christ, in that moment wherein the elect, being effectually called, are born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever, the spirit of life cooperating, are endued with a principle of new and spiritual life, are actually united to Christ, and being rescued from the power of darkness, are translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. The order of this internal and truly saving application, arising from its first beginning by many steps to perfect happiness in the adult, of whom only we now speak, is generally represented to us in this manner by the scriptures. As soon as comes the hour of gracious visitation, prefixed in the unchangeable purpose of God, for every one of the elect, all of a sudden, into the elect person living under the administration of the gospel, there is infused a principle of spiritual life by the application or influence of the Spirit of Christ, mystically uniting the soul to himself, the activity of which begins first to exert itself in the understanding illuminated with unusual light. For, as in the old creation, so also in this second, the beginning is with light. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. As soon as the elect person opens these enlightened eyes of his mind, he begins to discern in general the truth of evangelic doctrines. But at the same time, reflecting more particularly upon himself, he finds that great is the filthiness and the atrocity of his innumerable sins, great the rigor of divine justice, and that all the creatures have little or rather no strength to help him in his misery. It is not possible, but that hence there must arise a compunction of mind, grief for sins committed, and for the offence given to God. 
despair concerning himself and other creatures, and finally that anxious desire, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me? To the soul trembling in this matter, Jesus, the most merciful Saviour, discovers himself, with all the abundance of his grace and glory, which he spontaneously and freely offers to all who desire it. Nor does he offer it only, but also gently invites, and in a pathetic manner requests them to embrace it and in the meantime, penetrating the inward parts by the secret efficacy of his spirit, he with a gentle power allures the mind together with the will. Hence it is that the soul, surrounded with the luster of this celestial light, and so allured with all its might, receiveth Jesus for its saviour, and by this reception ratifies this inestimable gift and renders it irrevocable. This is the faith of God's elect, the praises of which is so often commended in the Holy Scripture." And since it consists in receiving Christ, it is evident that when we accept of him by faith, then only he is ours, not simply in right, but also in possession. In accepting him, we likewise accept, and by accepting, make all that righteousness which he fulfilled for us our own, which in the secret counsel of God was of old indeed put to our account, but in reality is offered to possession in effectual calling, and is possessed with saving benefit after it is accepted by faith. Further, as soon as the righteousness of Christ is made ours by faith, we are justified on its account, that is, God declares with a particular appropriation to our persons, that now we have passed from a state of wrath into a state of favour, and that whereas we were lately enemies, now we are reconciled to him and made friends, and shall hereafter enjoy his saving favour. This is the order of application taught both by Holy Scripture and by the evidence of the thing itself. Hence it follows that an elect person before his regeneration, while he gives himself up to luxury, lasciviousness, and all ungodly lusts, is in the way of perdition and destruction, and in his sins appears before God as odious, abominable, most deserving of all his wrath and curse, and it is impossible for him to escape impending wrath if he continue with obstinacy to go on in the way of wickedness. Truly, it is much safer and far more candid by sober speech to infuse these doctrines, and such as these, into a man, however certainly elected, that by the terror of the Lord he may be excited to faith, than to fill him with a persuasion that provided he be elected, God has no more to impute to him, though he live ever so wickedly, than if he were already received into heaven. Accurately speaking, such an elect person is in reality in a condemned state, not only in the court of his own conscience, but also in the court of God, to which that of conscience should never be contrary. Then only is he absolved from damnation as to his person when he begins to be in Christ, not according to the foreknowledge of God, but in actual union by the Spirit. Till that time he was under the law of sin and death, then he begins to be under the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1 and 2. This is the perpetual and the constant doctrine of the Scriptures from which we must not depart, no, not in the form of words. End of chapter 5。Chapter 6 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whether the elect are united to Christ before faith, and whether not only the fruits of his righteousness, but also the righteousness of Christ itself is imputed to them. If these things be properly considered, it will not be difficult to explain whether and in what way the elect are united to Christ before faith, or whether they are not. Doubtless they are united to him, one, in the eternal decree of God, which, however, includes nothing except that their actual union shall take place, as was already demonstrated. Two, by an union of eternal consent, wherein Christ was constituted by the Father the head of all those who were to be saved, and that he should represent their persons, hence it was that Christ, obeying the commandment of the Father, and suffering for them, they have reckoned in the judgment of God to have obeyed and suffered in him. All these things, however, do not hinder, but that, considered in themselves, before their regeneration, they are far from God and Christ, according to that their present state. By a true and real union, but which is only passive on their part, they are united to Christ when his Spirit first takes possession of them, 
and infuses into them a principle of new life, the beginning of which can be from nothing else but from union with the Spirit of Christ, who is to the soul, but in a far more excellent manner in respect of spiritual life, what the soul is to the body in respect of animal and human life. As therefore the union of soul and body is in order of nature prior to the life of man, so also the union of the Spirit of Christ and the soul is prior to the life of a Christian. Further, since faith is an act flowing from the principle of spiritual life, it is plain that, in a sound sense, it may be said, an elect person is truly and really united to Christ before actual faith. But the mutual union, which on the part of an elect person is likewise active and operative, whereby the soul draws near to Christ, joins itself to him, applies, and in a becoming and proper manner closes with him without any distraction, is made by faith only. And this is followed in order by the other benefits of the covenant of grace, justification, peace, adoption, sealing, perseverance, etc., which, if they be arranged in that manner and order, I know not whether any controversy concerning this affair can remain among the brethren. As to the imputation of Christ's righteousness in order to justification, I have learnt the following things from Scripture. As our sins were imputed to him, which we have proved above, so that very righteousness or obedience, which he performed to the Father in the most perfect holiness of his life and in his voluntary sufferings, is imputed to us. It is evident that in Scripture the righteousness of Christ is called our righteousness. Now it behoved to be ours, either by way of inhesion, by a certain transfusion whereby the habits of Christ's holiness and righteousness should become the habits of our soul, which transfusion of habits is absurd and impossible or by imitation that we should perform a righteousness conformable unto it. But in that sense the Apostle opposes it to ours, Philippians 3.9. Or finally, by imputation, so that it is reckoned no less ours than if it had been performed by us. Since, therefore, the two former ways whereby the righteousness of Christ might become ours are entirely contrary to reason, the latter only remains, viz. God imputing unto man righteousness without works, Romans 4.6. If I am not mistaken, it is confessed by all the Orthodox that the righteousness of Christ is so imputed to believers for justification, as Adam's sin is imputed to men for condemnation. Now it is so imputed that all are said to have sinned in him, so likewise we are said to be not only righteousness, but also pure righteousness, not only righteousness, but even the righteousness of God in Christ. Further, the righteousness of Christ consists partly in the most perfect holiness of his life, partly in his sufferings and death. Now the whole righteousness of Christ must be ours, if it be in our stead, in order to justification. Therefore, also the holiness of Christ is ours, in regard that perfect holiness is required in order to a title unto happiness. In Christ, therefore, we are righteous and holy, not by our own personal or inherent righteousness and holiness, but by that which is his and becomes ours by imputation. Moreover, since the righteousness and holiness of Christ are absolutely perfect and the same made ours, in respect whereof it is not improperly said that we are perfectly righteous and holy in Christ, why may it not be added no less than Christ himself? Although the honour of performing perfect holiness agrees to Christ only, not at all to us, who by nature are miserable sinners, and who only by the assistance of grace aspire to perfection at a great distance. Those things which belong to justification must be carefully separated from such as are proper to sanctification. If any man should boast that he had made such advances in the study of virtue and sanctity that he had reached its very summit, no less than Christ himself, he would be justly accused by all not only of lying and intolerable arrogance, but also of madness and blasphemy. But what believers are, by no means in themselves, that they are in Christ. There is no righteousness which can abide the severity of the divine tribunal except that which is absolutely perfect. Such only is the righteousness of Christ, and in virtue of his suretyship for the believing elect and their union with him, that righteousness becomes theirs. Since all the elect are equally partakers of it, they likewise must all, by the same most perfect righteousness of Christ, be perfectly righteous, even as Christ himself, since their righteousness is the very righteousness of Christ itself, with this difference only, that it is his because accomplished by him, ours because imputed to us. Certainly Paul is not afraid to say that we are complete in Christ, Colossians 2.10. 
on which place Davenant quotes that of Chrysostom from Homily 17 on the 10th to the Romans. But if thou believest in Christ, thou hast also fulfilled the law, and much more than it had commanded, forasmuch as thou hast now received a far greater righteousness. And a little before Chrysostom's words run thus, Therefore be not afraid, says he, after thou hast transgressed the law, since thou hast come to the faith, for then thou transgressest it, when by reason of it thou dost not believe in Christ, but if thou believest in him thou hast also fulfilled it, and much more than it had required, for thou hast received a far greater righteousness. Neither does the Palatine Catechism differ on question 60. The perfect satisfaction and holiness of Christ are so imputed and given to me, even as if I had neither committed any sin myself, nor did any corruption inhere in me, yea, as if I myself had accomplished that obedience which Christ accomplished for me. End of chapter 6Chapter 7 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning Paul's Judgment in the Matter of Justification and thus we find ourselves gradually brought forward to the doctrine of justification, concerning which I see these things chiefly controverted. 1. Whether Paul, when disputing concerning justification, handles this controversy almost only, whether salvation is obtained by the observation of the Mosaic laws, either alone and by themselves, as the Jews contended, or by them when joined to the gospel, as the Judaizing Christians disputed, or whether by a life framed according to the prescriptions of the gospel without the Mosaic ceremonies. 2. Whether consequently the faith intended by Paul in the matter of justification signifies partly the doctrine of the gospel in opposition to the Mosaic law, partly the practice of spiritual holiness according to the prescription of the gospel, in opposition to the works prescribed by the law of Moses, or a certain singular virtue which apart from other virtues relates to justification. 3. Whether, if justifying faith denotes a singular virtue, its essence consists in an inward and a most firm and full persuasion that Christ is mine, and that all my sins are certainly forgiven me for his sake. 4. Whether in justification faith be considered as an evidence and an argument that it is already granted, or as a condition pre-required by God in order to it, or as an instrument by which I lay hold of the righteousness of Christ. 5. Whether sorrow for sins committed, penitence and repentance, as a certain disposing condition, precede the remission of sins. 6. Whether all sins, not only past but also future, are, in justification, so forgiven together, and at once to believers, that God sees no more sin in the justified, that no deformity of sin, no guilt, no burden lies upon them, that no sin, however great, can truly hurt them, that God is not offended with any of their transgressions, that they need neither humiliation nor confession nor prayers in order to obtain the pardon of sin recently committed, finally, that immediately after the committing of sin they are as certain of pardon as after the deepest humiliation." As to the first question, the very learned gentleman, William Cave, in his book Concerning the Lives of the Apostles, hath at the end of Paul's life clearly and handsomely explained his own opinion and that of his abettors concerning it. He observes, therefore, that Paul's judgment can be best understood from that controversy which was held with the free Christian church, not only by the Jews, the enemies of the gospel, but also by some of the Jews converted to Christianity, but still seized with much veneration and zeal for the Mosaic laws. The former, indeed, contended violently that righteousness and life cannot be otherwise obtained than by the observation of the Mosaic laws, the beginning, the root, and foundation of which is circumcision. As for the latter, they admitted the gospel indeed, yet so that they would have the use of circumcision and other ceremonies joined to it, as a necessary part of that righteousness by which we must be justified. With both these kinds of men Paul had to do, he maintaining on the contrary that justification is not to be sought from the economy of the Mosaic law, neither in whole nor in part, but from the economy of evangelic doctrine, without all the apparatus of the ceremonies." and therefore by faith he understands sometime the doctrine of the gospel which he calls the law of faith 
in opposition to the Mosaic doctrine, which he calls the law of works. Sometimes that efficacious assent to be given to the gospel, which does not signify here any special virtue, but the universal condition of the new covenant, comprehending the exercise of all Christian virtues, all which the very learned man prosecutes accurately and at large, nor do I conceal it, that there are divines of great name, both among the French and us, whose sentiments are not far distant from these. This is a matter of greatest importance, and deserves to be treated with the utmost caution. Therefore, lest we err, we must take our rise a little higher. In this indeed I most cheerfully agree with the very learned men, that Paul's judgment is not otherwise better known than from the consideration of the errors which in his disputes he undertook to confute. He wrote to those who had happily exchanged partly Gentilism and partly Judaism for Christianity, and judged that it was his business to root up the prejudices of the old sect entirely from their minds, and to carry them from everything of their own, whether the worthiness of works and virtues, or satisfaction for sins, to the satisfaction and merits of Christ only, and to the absolute grace of God in him. The most of the Gentiles, living in gross ignorance of God and themselves, were not very solicitous concerning the remission of their sins, and generally not at all concerning the salvation of their souls. Others believed that the excellence of their virtues was so great that by it they could easily merit the favor of the gods, as well in this world as after death, if anything was to be then expected. They thought they could make ample satisfaction for their vices by their virtues, especially if they repented of their evil doing. They pronounced him innocent who repented that he had sinned. In their more atrocious crimes, by which an evil conscience told them they had deserved the wrath of the gods, they were wont to use lustrations of various kinds, also piacular sacrifices, sometimes even human, by which the deities might be appeased. But whereas the more sagacious perceived that even these were not sufficient, they imposed certain troublesome duties upon themselves, and by fastings, voluntary bodily afflictions, and spontaneous punishments, endeavoured to wash away their sins and to propitiate the deity. And they who were wisest of all taught that by nothing more than by reformation of life could the gods be pacified. That the Gentiles were thus minded is too obvious to need proof. The Jews went a little further, since there are two distinct parts in justification, the pardon of sin and a title unto life, it is proper to know what they thought of both. Though they teach that there are three classes of men, one of the just, whose righteousnesses downweigh their sins, another of the wicked, whose sins are far more and more heavy than their good deeds, a third of the intermediate kind, of whose actions you can scarcely say which preponderates, yet they believe there is none so perfectly righteous that he does not need remission and they believe that it may be obtained by the penitent confession of their sins and by the exercise of good works, or to express myself in their own words, Tzedaka, tzedaka, shinui Hashem, v'shinui ma'se, by alms, prayers, the change of the name and the change of practice, as also by afflictions, whether sent by God or patiently borne or spontaneously taken, hence fastings, sackcloth, abstinence from the use of the marriage bed, scourging, if necessary, frequent legal washings and sacrifices for sin. But to nothing do they attribute so much expiatory virtue as to those things which must be done on the anniversary day of expiation, by which they imagined all the iniquities of all the Israelites are taken away. In fine, if perhaps any guilt remained, they fancied that was washed away by death, hence that solemn saying, Mita kapara, let death be an expiation. And thus they thought their sins were expiated, but they believed that life could not be obtained otherwise than by the merits of their own works, and that therefore God had so multiplied his laws that occasion might be given the Israelites of meriting more abundantly and of acquiring various degrees of happiness. The Pharisees also added many things of their own to the divine law, that by that will-worship the value of their merits might be increased. In this, therefore, Gentilism and Judaism so far agreed that they placed both the expiation of sins and the obtaining of happiness in something which should be performed by themselves while they were totally ignorant of Messiah's righteousness. The error of many was increased by the circumcision of Christians, who would have the observation of the Mosaic laws, for a part at least of righteousness, joined to the righteousness of Christ, as it is taught in the Gospel. 
All these errors together Paul impugns and confutes, proving at large that there is none, neither Gentile nor Jew, who by any work done, either according to the law of nature or the law of Moses, or devised by men themselves, can acquire, either in whole or in part, an immunity from punishment and a right to life and salvation, but that, with the denial of all our own righteousness, all these things must be sought in Christ alone, to whom we are not united but by faith. This is the sum of that doctrine which the Apostle handles with the utmost accuracy, especially in the Epistle to the Romans. The first proposition of which we find, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where he extols the gospel of Christ as the power of God unto salvation to every one who believeth, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. But from whence hath the gospel such a power to save? It is from hence, because in it is revealed the true righteousness which gives a title unto life. What is that righteousness? Not our own, consisting in our virtues or our works, but God's, which has him for its author, Philippians 3, nine, which he promised by the prophets, Isaiah 45.24, 54.17, which was fulfilled and brought in by Christ, God-man, who is Jehovah our righteousness, and finally, which on account of its perfection, is approved by God and avails before him, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Romans 5.21, and which is opposed to our own personal righteousness, Romans 10.3. Now this righteousness is from faith. It is revealed, offered, and conveyed by the gospel as the hand of God exhibiting it. It is accepted by faith as the hand of the soul apprehending it. Further, it is so from faith that it is also to faith, it is from faith, whereby I believe the testimony of God the Father concerning his Son, and the life which is in him, whereby I draw near unto him, that I may claim the right of the sons of God, whereby I flee to him as the stronghold of my salvation, whereby, in fine, I receive him to be my Saviour. It is to faith, whereby I believe, and am firmly persuaded that God is my shield and my exceeding great reward, that Christ is my most lovely Saviour, and finally, that I am now in a state of grace and in the certain expectation of glory. Compare Romans 5.1. Unless we rather choose to explain from faith to faith thus, that it denotes a faith which begins and consummates, and that therefore it is faith only, which alone so avails here from the beginning to the end, that it neither comes into the assistance of preceding works, nor does it call in the aid of those which follow. But why was it necessary that the righteousness which is from faith should be revealed by the gospel? For this reason, because neither Gentiles nor Jews have any righteousness of their own by which they can obtain expiation of sins and a title to life. This the apostle proves distinctly, first concerning the Gentiles, who, whether they were openly wicked or a little more refined, had all so sinned against the law of nature that they had incurred its curse then concerning the Jews, by whom the Mosaic law was so far from being observed that they, no less than the Greeks, are under sin. Hence it comes to pass that every mouth is stopped and all the world is obnoxious to the divine condemnation. Hence the conclusion is that no flesh shall be justified by the deeds of the law, whether natural or Mosaic, but that another righteousness is required, which without the law is manifested." inasmuch as it does not consist in certain duties to be performed by ourselves in virtue of the obligation of the law and in order to justification but it is the righteousness of god by faith and which is common to believers without distinction of jew or greek further this righteousness is not placed in the observation of the duties prescribed by the gospel as if that were now obtained by it which the greeks and jews sought in vain every one in the observation of their own laws and their own religion for we are said to be justified freely without any cause of justification being in us. But it is placed in the grace of God, and in the redemption which is in Christ, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. In fine, all things tend to this, that the glory of our salvation should be wholly transferred to God and Christ, and our boasting entirely banished. Boasting is to say something of one's self, which is the cause either of escaping judgment, or of the right of expecting the inheritance, or even of claiming something from God. Such boasting is altogether excluded, not by the law of works, that is, by that doctrine which shows that salvation is to be obtained by works, and gives the man who performs it the confidence of boasting, but by the law of faith, which teaches that righteousness is to be sought in Christ, and apprehended by faith without any action of ours, which may anyhow come into consideration here. Compare Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. 
This is the process of Paul's disputation directly opposite to the errors both of Jews and Gentiles, who each sought in their own works the expiation of their offences and a title to life, and being ignorant of the righteousness of God, went about to establish their own righteousness. Which controversy indeed is very distant from that other, whether the ceremonies must be joined to the gospel, of which he treats more fully in the epistle to the Galatians. For there was another occasion given for this epistle than for that to the Romans. After Paul had faithfully taught the Galatians the pure gospel of Christ, there had come suddenly in his absence certain false teachers corrupting the true seed with their dogmas. For they taught that the observation of the ceremonies was a thing very necessary even to Christians in order to obtain justification and salvation. And because it was quite evident from the whole tenor of his doctrine that Paul was otherwise minded, hence they went about by every kind of cavils and calumnies to diminish his authority, they also boasted of their consent with Peter, James, and John, who, without dispute, were the most celebrated amongst the apostles. And perhaps that they might the more successfully insinuate themselves into the Galatians, they pretended the names of such great apostles as if they had been sent by them. To this boasting Paul vigorously opposed himself, lest he should give place to falsehood and suffer the truth to be oppressed in his person. Therefore he laboriously defends the authority of his apostleship against the calumnies of deceitful men. Having finished this business, he proceeds to the merits of the cause about the end of his second chapter, verse 15, and he so prosecutes it, that even from the beginning he useth general arguments, and almost the same which he had used in the epistle to the Romans. Very unjustly, says he, is the observation of the ceremonies required as a part of righteousness from men converted to Christ, because righteousness consists in no works of whatever law, and therefore not in these of the ceremonial law, but only in the faith of Christ. Hence he tells us that, he said to Peter, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The sense of which words is this, we who seem to excel others and by the benefit of the covenant were always near to God, Yet we find no method of obtaining salvation but by believing in Christ. Why should we prescribe another to the Gentiles? For if the law were necessary or could profit its observers unto salvation, it would chiefly profit us to whom it was given. But if forsaking it we have fled to Christ, much less must the Gentiles be urged to receive it. We therefore who are Jews by nature, what have we done? We have believed in Christ, apprehended his righteousness by faith. What is the end of believing? that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. For what cause? Since we were convinced that men cannot obtain righteousness by the works of the law. Here now he is engaged in the chief question, yea, in this one proposition almost the whole sum of the controversy is included, as Calvin, that most sagacious interpreter of the sacred scriptures, hath excellently observed. And thus, if I am not mistaken, we have clearly shown that Paul's design in both epistles is this, that he may recall Christians, whether Jews or Gentiles, from all presumption on their own righteousness, with which we are all puffed up by nature, to apprehend the righteousness of Christ alone by faith. Hence he concludes that the zealots for the pharisaical doctrine were deceived, who, not content with the righteousness of Christ and faith alone, urged the necessity of the Mosaic economy. But this controversy he handles chiefly in the epistle to the Galatians, partly by those arguments which are common to works of whatever law, partly by those which are more specially referred to the ceremonial law. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning the law of works, the works of the law, and faith. And hence we must judge what Paul understands by the law of works, what by the works of the law, and what by faith. The law of works is that which demands works to be done by man himself as the condition of life, or the cause of claiming the reward. The tenor of which is this, the man who doeth these things shall live in them, Romans 
Such a law was given to Adam of old, who, if he had persevered in his integrity, would have obtained a right to eternal life by his works of righteousness. The same doctrine Moses repeated in his ministry, for he also inculcated the same precepts upon which the covenant of works had been built. He both repeated the same solemn saying, He who doeth these things shall live by them, Leviticus 18.5, and also added another, Cursed be he who shall not perform the words of this law in doing them, Deuteronomy 27.26. That this is the curse of the law, as it stands opposed to the covenant of grace, Paul teacheth, Galatians 3.10, which, however, is not so to be understood as if God had intended by the ministry of Moses to make a new covenant of works with Israel, with a view to obtain righteousness and salvation by such a covenant but that repetition of the covenant of works was designed to convince the Israelites of their sin and misery, to drive them out of themselves, to teach them the necessity of a satisfaction, and to compel them to cleave to Christ, and thus it was subservient to the covenant of grace. Romans 10.4 Meanwhile, the carnal Israelites, not attending to the purpose of God, mistook the true sense of this covenant, embraced it as a covenant of works, and sought their righteousness by it. See Romans 9, 31 and 32. For the most part of them, invited to the covenant of God, rashly bound themselves to observe all that he should say, neither considering rightly the spiritual perfection of the law, nor their own inability, thinking indeed that both parties behoved to act equally by their own powers, that it might be an equal covenant, and that they would stand no less to their promises than God to his. And thus they made the whole law of Moses a covenant of works to themselves, while by an unwary promise they bound themselves to obey it, that they might obtain the life promised by God. Having found, therefore, what the law of works is, it is easy to perceive what are the works of the law, viz. all the good deeds performed according to the prescription of the law, whether they consist in the duties of moral virtues, which are the works of righteousness that we have done, as Paul speaks, Titus 3.5, or in the performance of certain things which God enjoined to obtain a certain typical expiation of sins, especially if they be done with the opinion of obtaining life or pardon by these works. I know not by what right the very learned man takes it for granted that, by the works of the law, which Paul excludes from justification, are understood works before conversion done without faith by our own strength, which popish fiction the Protestant champions have so often and so solidly refuted, that it is amazing a Protestant is found who again patronizes it. Let Calvin be heard at present instead of all. Institutes, Book 3, Chapter 11, Section 14. I have resolved, however, to dispute not by his authority, but by his arguments. Sophisters, says he, who take pleasure and pastime in corrupting the scriptures, and in empty cavils, think to escape by subtlety, for they expound works to be those which the irregenerate perform only literally, by the exertions of free will, without the grace of Christ. But they deny that this has a respect to spiritual works. Thus, according to them, a man is justified both by faith and works, provided the works are not his own, but the gifts of Christ, and the fruits of regeneration. For that Paul spoke so, for no other reason but to convince the Jews, trusting in their own strength, that they foolishly claimed righteousness to themselves, since the Spirit of Christ alone confers it on us, and not any exertions from nature's own motion. But they do not observe that in the opposition between legal and evangelical righteousness, which Paul states elsewhere, all works are excluded, with whatever title they may be adorned. For he teaches that the righteousness of the law is this, that the man may obtain salvation who performs what the law commands, but that the righteousness of faith is this, if we believe that Christ died and rose again, Romans 10, 5-9, Galatians 3, 11-12. Hence it follows that even spiritual works comes not into the account when justifying virtue is ascribed unto faith, and when Paul denies that Abraham had whereof to glory before God, because he was not righteous by works, this ought not be restrained to the literal and external kind of virtues, or to the exertions of free will. But that, although the patriarch's life was spiritual, yea, almost angelic, yet it could not supply the merit of works which might procure him righteousness before God. By these reasons, Calvin confutes the cavil concerning the mere acts of free will, and solidly indeed, if judgment has not entirely forsaken me. 
Chrysostom uses the same arguments, whom the very learned man, Dr. Cave, I apprehend will gladly hear speak in his, Chrysostom's, own language. Let him hear him therefore pleading thus, homily two in Epistle to the Romans, O apostolos thulete vixet oti que Abraham ec pisteos edicioce, oper en periuse nikes polis. Domengar erga me ejunta ec pisteos diceocene, tinauden apescos donne comonta en catorzomas. Me enteften al apopiseos geneste dicion tuto en thavmason. The apostle means to show that even Abraham was justified by faith, in which indeed there is the excellence of a mighty victory. For that a man who hath no works should be justified by faith is no how unlikely, but that one adorned with good works should be just, not by them, but by faith, that certainly is wonderful. Do you see how carefully, how solicitously he removes from justification not only that righteousness, or these works, which are done before conversion by the strength of free will, but all without exception, even these with which Abraham was richly adorned beyond other men? but i have been too tedious in a matter so very plain and which ought to be uncontroverted among all the orthodox neither is that true which is otherwise pretended viz that the works of the law which are opposed to faith signify the perfect observation of the law which the legal covenant demands for the state of the controversy was not whether a man could be justified by the perfect observation of the law which none in his wits would ever deny neither was it whether there are very many men who after the first sin of adam committed no sin during the whole period of their life and finished every perfection of parts degrees and perseverance which none in his senses would say but the question was this whether the jews could be justified by that observation of the law which they could perform that they certainly thought viz that they could be justified provided they observed the law of moses to the utmost of their power and made these satisfactions for their offences which the ceremonial law prescribed but this the apostle denies resting on that axiom that the righteousness which can be sustained before god's tribunal must be absolutely perfect and since no works of any men are such he concludes that no works of whatever kind can contribute anything to the obtaining of justification the apostle without doubt excludes these works upon which they commonly rested who went about to establish their own righteousness now it is not credible that there was any of them who would say that through the whole course of their life they had kept themselves unstained even from every the least little spot of sin these things are evident that faith sometimes signifies the doctrine of the gospel concerning salvation to be obtained through christ because it is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance and because it demands that it be believed in order to salvation i do not at all doubt and thus it is opposed to the law of works which is satisfied not by believing but by perfectly fulfilling its commandments but at the same time none will deny that in the matter of justification faith very frequently if not for the most part denotes some act of the man who is justified and as he is justified romans one seventeen three twenty two four three to five galatians two sixteen and innumerable other passages but what is that act if we hear sosinus to believe in Christ is nothing else than to show ourselves obedient to God according to the law and prescription of Christ, and in doing that to expect a crown of eternal life from Christ himself, from which the brethren, with whom we now dispute, depart but a little, if they depart at all, who likewise define faith a certain new manner of mind and life and obedience to the commands of Christ. I would not deny indeed that such an obedience is inseparable from that faith by which we are justified, but to understand it by the name of faith when it is opposed to works seems to me as foreign to Paul's purpose as foreign can be. The brethren confess that he disputes against those who sought justification by the works of the Mosaic laws. They confess likewise that three kinds of precepts are found in these laws, some of which used to be called moral, others judicial, and others ceremonial now let us set aside for a little the judicial and the ceremonial what are the chief heads of the moral precepts these if i mistake not that every one of the israelites should turn to god with all his heart should love and worship him with all his mind and with the utmost efforts of all his power should love his neighbour as himself and be holy as the lord god is holy he who doth these things does the works of the mosaic law according to that part at least which is moral 
which surely they by no means intended to omit, who sought righteousness by the law. For none of the Jews or Judaizing Christians were senseless to such a degree as to imagine that justification could be obtained merely by the observation of the judicial and ceremonial laws, while the moral were disregarded. Let us go on. What is the sum of Christ's commandments in the gospel? That every one seriously repent, love God above all things, do to his neighbour what he wishes done to himself, be holy according to his example who hath called him, and in fine be perfect as his heavenly Father is perfect. How much do these differ from the Mosaic precepts? They are so far from differing in any instance that the Lord comprehended the sum of evangelical morals in the same words which Moses used. I would wish to be informed of three things here by the very learned men. One, wherein the commands of Christ exceed the commands of the moral law of Moses, for it seems to me that nothing sublimer and more divine can be commanded than to love God with all the heart and mind, and to be holy after his example. Two, why the same obedience or the performance of the same duties is called a work in reference to the commandments of the Mosaic law, but faith in relation to the commandments of the gospel. 3. Why the Israelites could not be justified of old by the same duties performed to the Mosaic law by which Christians are now justified, if they be performed according to the evangelical law, or if Paul meant that the Israelites of old were also justified by their sincere observation of the moral law, why did he not finish the matter by one distinction, and that very easy by hinting that righteousness is not of the ceremonial or judicial law, but of the moral only? especially if it be so considered as Christ hath illustrated it in the gospel. Why did he not add that by a new word and hitherto unheard of in that sense he called the observation of that law faith? Could he not have said much more clearly and distinctly, righteousness is not in that part of the law which you erroneously urge, but in that other part which treats of charity and sanctity according to the image of God, and which Christ in the gospel illustrated in the clearest manner by new explications, and which I now commend to you under the name of faith? Further, not only in the article of justification, but also often elsewhere, the scripture speaks of faith as a certain singular virtue, distinct from other virtues and from obedience to the commands of Christ or evangelical holiness. Paul says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the demonstration of those which are not seen. Hebrews 11.1 1. John places it in receiving the testimony of God, which he hath testified concerning his own Son. 1 John 5.9 John 3.33, or in receiving Christ himself, viz. for this purpose that he may be our Saviour, John 1.12. Elsewhere it is distinguished from hope and charity, 1 Corinthians 13.13, 1 Thessalonians 1.3, 2 Thessalonians 1.3, as also from sanctification, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. Neither do I remember any place where faith is defined by holiness, exacted according to the rule of the gospel. I know indeed that the Apostle commended the obedience of faith to the Romans, Romans 1, 5, 16, 26, but evident it is that that may be understood in two senses, either thus that faith itself is called obedience performed, namely to that precept in which we are commanded to assent to the testimony of God and to believe in Christ, as the Apostle elsewhere praises a professed subjection to the gospel of Christ, 2 Corinthians 9, 13. Or thus, that that is called the obedience of faith, which proceeds from faith as the effect from its cause, for so he uses to speak. That joy which follows from faith as a fountain he calls the joy of faith, Philippians 1.25, and in the same sense he writes concerning the work of faith, the labour of love, and the patience of hope. But to no purpose are we bid compare Galatians 5.6, both with chapter 6 verse 15, and with 1 Corinthians 7.19, as if from that which he had said in the first place, that in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love, and that in the second place, instead of faith, he mentions a new creature, and in the third, the keeping the commandments of God, we might conclude that faith is entirely the same with the new creature, and the keeping the commandments of God. For from these testimonies this only is evinced, that the excellence of all external things is of much less value with God than the inward state of a well-disposed mind, such as faith, the new creature, and the keeping of God's commandments, all which things so belong to the inward man, that they are not therefore entirely the same. For certainly faith is distinct from charity, by which it worketh. But neither does James give occasion to believe that Paul, by the works which he excludes from justification, 
understood those which were done either by men's own powers or according to the Mosaic law, but not such as were done by faith and the observation of the evangelical law, as if James called that works which Paul designed by the name of faith, that he might show that Paul by faith understood works performed according to the prescription of the gospel. For though I would not deny to the very learned man that James vindicates and explains Paul's doctrine, forcibly snatched away by perverse men to impious purposes, yet it is clear to me at least that Paul treats of one justification, James of another. For because Paul had taught that a man is justified by faith without works, hence some had inferred that in whatever manner a man live, it equally suffices that he persuade himself that Christ is his saviour which they could have inferred with no plausibility, if that had been evident, which the very learned man will have to be so, viz. that Paul by faith understood evangelical godliness. But because Paul's words evidently bore that sense that faith was a thing distinct from all the works of holiness, as in reality it is, hence arose the pretext of calumny. I say of calumny, for though Paul taught that works contribute nothing to justification or to procure a man's title to salvation, yet he always taught that they were not only useful but also necessary to salvation, and that it is impossible that sanctification should be separated from justification. James treads in the same path and teaches that it is necessary that he who is justified by faith should also be justified by works, that is, perform these works which are the evidences and effects of righteousness, and by which it is demonstrated not only before men, but also before God, that he is righteous, according to that of John. He who doeth righteousness is righteous. 1 John 3, 7. Indeed, there is a double justification, one of a man sinful in himself, whereby he is absolved from sin and declared to have a title to eternal life, on account of Christ's righteousness apprehended by faith, which Paul inculcated. Another of a man righteous already, sanctified by the Spirit of Christ, and who is declared to be such by his words and actions. James teaches that this is so necessary and so connected with the former that he is deceived, who boasts of that and is destitute of this. But since we have professedly handled this subject elsewhere, we may supersede the further discussion of it at present. End of chapter 8「Conciliatory or Irenical Animate Versions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians » by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning the Essence of Faith Having observed, therefore, what is Paul's scope when disputing concerning justification, and demonstrated that faith is not obedience to the commands of Christ, or the practice of evangelical holiness, but a singular virtue, having a distinct consideration from other virtues, it follows that we inquire in what the essence of that faith consists. There are who define it by an inward and a most firm persuasion that Christ is mine, and that all my sins are certainly forgiven me for his sake. To others this definition appears incautious and inaccurate. My judgment is that faith may be considered two ways, either as in itself, and in idea, as they speak, or as in the subject. In the first respect, it is a most excellent virtue delineated in the gospel, to the perfection of which it becomes every Christian to aspire. In the last respect, it is often found in believers to be very weak and involved in thick clouds. If we consider faith as in idea, the constant doctrine of the Reformed Church, which is agreeable to the Scriptures, is that it consists not only in a full assurance and in the firmest persuasion of the truth of the gospel in general, but also in particular of my right to Christ and all the benefits of salvation, and that therefore every Christian should endeavour to know that he is in the faith and in Christ, and be able to say with Paul, Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor any other creature can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. 
In this sense, the authors of the Palatine Catechism, with innumerable other divines of our communion, have said that faith is not only a certain knowledge, whereby I firmly assent to all things which God hath revealed in his word, but also an assured trust kindled in my heart by the Holy Ghost, through the gospel whereby I acquiesce in God, being assuredly persuaded that remission of sins, eternal righteousness, and life are given not to others only, but to me also by the mercy of God through the merits of Christ alone. But though such an assurance belongs entirely to faith, yet I rather judge that it is a most eminent degree of faith, to which we do not rise, but by many previous acts, than that the very essence of faith can be placed in it. For the natural progress of faith, so to speak, seems to be this, that the believing soul beholds in the light of grace the mystery of God and of Christ, and anon with full consent acknowledges the truth of it, on account of the authority of God who beareth witness." Then further, that he loves that truth, exalts in it, and glorifies God, likewise that he ardently desires communion with Christ, that these things which are true in Christ may also be true to him unto salvation, that therefore with the highest pleasure he accepts of Christ when and in what manner he is offered to him in the gospel, rests and reclines upon him, gives himself up, and makes himself over unto him. And then, that after all these things, having now discovered his mutual union with him, he glorieth that Christ is his, delighting most gladly in him. Who doubts, but this is a certain desirable perfection of a very strong faith, deserving our most rigorous efforts to reach it, and which apostles, apostolic heroes, and martyrs dear to God, and others to whom a more eminent measure of the Spirit was vouchsafed, obtain in reality? and of which examples are not wanting even in our own time, yea, it is very credible that God grants it, sometimes at least, in this life, more sparingly or more abundantly to the most of his elect. For it is by no means the lot of all believers so to ascend the height of that most pleasant and most holy boasting, that on it they should securely and gladly pass all their time which yet behoved to be the case if indeed the very essence of faith consisted in the boldness and full assurance of that trust i would rather place it in the reception of christ as a saviour and lord and in the flight of the soul to him the english confession composed in the year sixteen forty five expresses the matter to excellent purpose the principal acts of faith are to accept receive and rest upon christ alone for justification sanctification and eternal life by virtue of the covenant of grace these very divines who define faith by an assurance of that nature concerning the remission of sins observe, however, that it is not always found in all believers. Chamia is of those who teach that believers know by faith, not only by an universal or rather by a certain indefinite knowledge that some shall be saved or that those shall be saved who have believed, but also by a particular knowledge that they themselves shall be saved because they believe and that therefore this application constitutes the difference between true justifying faith and historical he adds that this knowledge is joined with certainty but the measure of which is no other than that of faith that therefore the certainty of perfect faith is perfect and that of imperfect is also imperfect but says he as when describing the nature of faith we ought not to insist on the defects of individuals so also in this certainty as therefore we declare that there is opposed to faith not only the falsity of the thing believed, but also the doubting of the person who believes it, as there is none so advanced while in this life who does not need to pray, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief, Mark 9.24. It is entirely so in this matter. It is the part of the believer to conclude with certainty that he shall be saved by faith, and that he is not a believer except he so conclude although it be true that from the feeling of the flesh and of his own infirmity other judgments are suggested whereby that kind of certainty may be shaken, so that he seems sometimes to degenerate into unbelief. But even in these, as in other temptations, we are more than conquerors. Thus, that very grave divine who after a little subjoins, God forbid we should be so ignorant of human infirmity, which we confess is always in some degree in every regenerate person, that we should place faith beyond all sense of temptation. He feels, he often feels indeed, wonderful motions from his own unworthiness from the world and from Satan, and he so feels that he cannot but be affected, and so staggers that he is almost like one in despair, but wrestling for a time he overcomes at last, therefore he never despairs. I have spoken too laxly, 
what even the papists themselves do not deny. Therefore I say more. He always believes, he always certainly believes, that salvation is his own, namely, because by believing he fights, by believing he overcomes. Thus far, Chemia, Panstrati Catholica, Volume 3, Book 13, Chapter 1. To Chemia may be joined Peter du Moulin, who, after he had treated at large concerning that persuasion whereby one applies to himself the promises of the gospel, believing that his sins are forgiven for Christ's sake, expresses himself elegantly in these words, Yet is it not the design of these things that as many should be expunged from the role of believers as have not yet obtained this full persuasion of faith, which God gives not to all at the same time, nor in the same measure? But that we may be taught this assurance is commanded by God, and is earnestly to be asked from Him, and that with all our might we must endeavour that by prayer and good works it may be strengthened and increased. Add that there is place for weak faith but not feigned. Even the purblind perceive the way nor were they equally quick-sighted, who were healed by looking at the brazen serpent. Thus far Molinus. Disput de fud inst. Part 2. Thess. 39. Perkins also observes very prudently in his Catholic Reformed Controversies 16 concerning implicit faith, that the doctrine of some catechisms is well explained, which seem to define faith in the highest and most perfect degree, while they say it is a certain persuasion of mind concerning the love and favour of God towards us in Christ. For although, says he, all faith be in its nature a certain persuasion, yet a perfect persuasion only is a firm and consummate faith. Therefore faith ought to be defined not only in general and in the highest degrees, but also its various degrees and its measures should be set forth, even that they who are weak may be truly and properly taught concerning their state. Neither do I doubt, but those very brethren will confess this who otherwise seem to be exercised in extremes, and to love rigid and hyperbolical phrases. I conclude with Davenant's words, than which scarcely anything can be more clearly and more accurately expressed, and in which I could hardly wish all would acquiesce. The word trust, says he, signifies two things— the very act of resting upon and cleaving unto Christ, whereby we embrace him as with both arms, and by that act endeavour to obtain from God the Father pardon, grace, and glory. And this, we think, is that act upon which justification always follows, that is, absolution from sin and acceptance into divine grace and favour. Whether the sinner at that very moment conceive the full persuasion of having obtained remission or not, Trust uses also sometimes to denote the consequent effect of justifying faith, namely a full persuasion and, as it were, a lively sense of having obtained remission and the divine favour. We confess that this trust is not justifying faith, but the daughter of justifying faith, to which the soul does not use to rise except after many exercises of faith and holiness. Thus far in a book entitled Determinations of Certain Theological Questions, Question 37, by the venerable and very learned Bishop of Salisbury, who once bore a great part in our synod at Dort. End of chapter 9of conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. What relation faith has to justification? Hence we have a convenient transition to that question what relation faith bears in the matter of justification, whether as a certain cause of granting it, or as an evidence and argument that it is already granted. These seem very distant from one another, if we attend to the sound of the words, but the controversy will appear much less when the thing itself, stripped of their ambiguity, shall be exposed naked to the eye, and at the same time it will appear whose phrases are most agreeable to the style of Scripture, which we shall attempt to dispatch in the following manner. Justification is an absolution from sins. Absolution from sins is a declaration that divine justice is satisfied for them by the surety. That declaration imports that the sins for which satisfaction has been made are not imputed to elect sinners for their condemnation, but that the surety's satisfaction is imputed to them for righteousness. The imputation of the surety's righteousness has various periods, and relates either in general to all the elect collected into one mystical body, or to each of them considered apart. 
for as has been often inculcated, Christ dying, God reconciled the whole world of his elect unto himself at once, and declared that he would not impute their trespasses to them, and that for the sake of Christ's perfect satisfaction, 2 Corinthians 5.19. For my part, therefore, I can allow that act of God to be called the general justification of the elect. Certainly Christ was justified, then God raised him from the dead and gave the discharge of the payment made by Christ and accepted by himself. And the same Christ was raised for our justification, Romans 4.25. For when he was justified, the elect at the same time were justified in him, in regard that he represented them. Here I choose to add Charnock's commentary on the passage just now quoted from Paul, volume 2, page 321 of his English works. For the exquisite pleasure God took in Christ's sufferings upon the Mount Calvary, he graciously forgot our sins, and of rebels declared us heirs. In this discharge of Christ there is a fundamental justification of them who shall be and believe, though not formal nor actual till they believe as there was a fundamental condemnation of all in the loins of Adam upon his fall, not actual, till they were in being and did actually partake of his nature, after the same manner Christ being absolved as a surety, all they whom he represented and whose sins he bore have in that absolution of his a fundamental absolution from all penal sufferings. When, as a common person, he bore the sins of many in the offering of himself and satisfied for their guilt, then, as the head, he obtained the absolution of all those whose guilt he had taken upon him, that they should no more lie under the burden of their sins, or incur the punishment denounced in the law. These things may suffice from Charnock, for what follows is too tedious. Let us return to our purpose. This general, or as Charnock calls it, fundamental justification, is followed by another more special and more actual, which is applied to every elect person one by one. And this again has the following tendency, either that the first beginning of saving grace and spiritual life be communicated to the man on account of Christ's satisfaction in his stead, or that he be declared to be now in a state of grace. Surely it is not possible that God should be pleased to bless the sinner with the first communication of his grace and endow him with the beginning of spiritual life, except on the consideration of Christ's merits, which he declares to belong to this man in particular, when he begins to confer upon him those things which Christ obtained by his obedience and death. And thus far it may be said that that man is justified in the first regeneration, that is declared to be one of those for whom Christ purchased a right to life, by virtue of which right he is now raised from spiritual death to life. It is evident that all these periods of the imputation of Christ's righteousness are prior to actual faith and if you choose to call them by the name of justification, though I doubt if you can with the concurrence of Scripture, surely in this view faith is a consequence, a fruit, an evidence, and an argument of justification. However, justification, according to the style of Scripture, generally denotes that act of God whereby he declares that man has now passed from a state of wrath and hostility into a state of grace and friendship, and enjoys the privilege of the remission of sins and the hope of glory, which maketh not ashamed. Now this justification is of faith and by faith, as Paul everywhere teacheth, and consequently the effect and fruit of faith, the result of regeneration and effectual calling. Whom he called he also justified. Such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are justified. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, knowing that a man is not justified, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ. These scripture phrases are too evident, proper, and forcible to be wrested by unnatural interpretations. Surely it cannot be denied, but that he speaks ordinarily, if not always according to the tenor of scripture, who reckons faith among the causes of that justification, concerning which the whole of Paul's disputation turns. Now he did not dispute concerning the manifestation of justification alone, but concerning itself. Much more does faith precede the sense of justification and the delights of ineffable peace and friendship with God. But if faith is to be reckoned among the causes of justification, what kind of cause is it? Whether is it a condition of justification which the gospel demands, in place of that most perfect obedience which the law demanded of old? Or is it an instrument whereby we apprehend Christ and his righteousness offered to us in the gospel? 
To speak freely, the first opinion seems to me indeed to be the introduction of a new law, whereby the most pleasant, the most gracious, and the most glorious nature of the gospel of Christ is not a little corrupted. I do not now insist on Sosinus, who, denying the satisfaction of Christ and the imputation of his righteousness, perverts the whole gospel. I have to do with brethren, who, revering the satisfaction of Christ and piously acknowledging his righteousness as the only meritorious cause of our salvation, yet speak incautiously concerning faith. They err, I apprehend, in the following instances. First, that under the name of faith they include the hope of pardon and the love of God, likewise sorrow for sin and the purpose of a new life, and, in one word, all the acts requisite to a true, serious repentance and to an obedience performed to the gospel from a sincere heart through faith. And all these they mean to be something quite necessary and altogether prerequisite in order to be received into favour with God and to be accounted by Him as justified to which assertion I lately opposed my considerations, to which I now add that the most learned professors of our religion in the Netherlands reckoned that the remonstrance, omitting the same doctrine in similar terms, the mask being torn off, a tribute to faith the Socinian and the Popish manner of justifying, which they prove by solid arguments. See the censure of the professors of Leiden, chapter 10, section 2, 3. So far is it from being true that ever our church acknowledged that doctrine for its own. Secondly, that they would have this faith to succeed in place of that perfect obedience which the legal covenant demanded. For instead of it is substituted in the covenant of grace the perfect obedience of Christ, whereby the righteousness of the law is fulfilled. Thirdly, that they consider faith in that notion and signification as an action performed by us according to the command, and by the grace of God, in consideration of which he, by a certain gracious constitution, is pleased to give us the righteousness of Christ and remission of sins. Fourthly, that they will have that condition to be demanded of us by the gospel, that we may be accounted righteous and innocent before God. For the condition of justification, properly speaking, is nothing but perfect obedience. This the law demands. Neither does the gospel substitute another, but it teacheth that the law is satisfied by Christ the surety. Further, that it is the office of faith to accept the satisfaction offered to it, and by accepting to make it its own. And that thus, according to the gracious constitution of God revealed in the gospel, all believers are justified by faith. And this is the genuine judgment of the reformed church which I have elsewhere vindicated at large. Let us now sacrifice to peace and harmony, after we have provided for the truth. As Britain knows, so I wish it not to be unknown to our provinces, that all those do not recede far from the truth in this cause, who otherwise, with some, come under the name of Neonomians. Truly, candour does not allow, nor doth piety permit, that we should overlook the consent of some brethren in orthodoxy as unworthy of praise. I at least read with great pleasure that clear and distinct catechism concerning justification and justifying faith, page 13, wherein the very reverend Daniel Williams explained his mind in defence of evangelic truth, to exhibit a summary of which at present is both his interest and that of the public. He therefore professes and teaches that our sins are pardoned only for the sake of Christ's merits and righteousness imputed to us that our faith is not that righteousness on account of which or for the sake of which we obtain forgiveness, that God does not by a certain acceptation admit of faith or any imperfect obedience in place of that perfect obedience which the law demands as righteousness, in consideration of which he reckons us worthy of the pardon of sins and eternal life, as if, for Christ's sake, he had abrogated the law for this purpose, for that in this way the merits of Christ are excluded as the only procuring cause of remission and eternal life that neither faith nor any other thing in man is the cause of remission in regard that it is the free and generous grace of god that god did not only decree or christ purchase that the elect should be able to obtain remission if they believe but also that they should certainly believe and infallibly obtain remission that that faith to which god gives remission is that assurance in christ my crucified saviour whereby i receive him wholly excluding all his rivals for justification sanctification and glory relying on his merits fulness power and care to perform in his own way everything which he hath promised and which i want not indeed that we receive remission before we receive Christ, but that we receive himself with all his benefits. Yet so that I first believe remission of sins is laid up in him for me as well as other sinners, provided I receive him by faith. 
that the use of faith to obtain this remission is not that it purchases, causes, or in any way effectuates it, but that it answers to the rule of the gospel according to which God has been pleased to apply to us the righteousness of Christ, yet so that even faith itself is reckoned among the fruits of Christ's death. That therefore we do not by faith obtain a right to remission for Christ's sake, but that the promise of God gives us a right to remission for the sake of Christ's merits when we believe. Meanwhile, he rather inclines to call faith the condition of remission than the instrument, because he thinks that under the notion of an instrument more causality than is just is ascribed unto faith, yet so that he easily excuses them who choose to use that word, since he believes they understand nothing else but a moral instrument which is equivalent to a condition. Hence the orthodox are wont to use these words promiscuously. He adds, it is the office of faith to look to Christ and his righteousness to rely upon it, and to accept of it, in order to forgiveness, and that, in this matter, faith has a singular consideration beyond every other inherent grace. But that we obtain forgiveness by faith is not so much from this, that we receive Christ by faith, as that this is the ordinance of God, that whosoever receives him, his sins are forgiven him. To which I now add the excellent words of the conciliatory letter sent to me from England, we declare that though regeneration, conversion to God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, and a holy conversation be expressly required in the word of God, as manifestly necessary to the salvation of a sinner, nevertheless none of these, nor any work done by man, nor produced by the Spirit of God in him, is under the notion of subordination, or under any other denomination whatsoever, a part of that righteousness for which, or in consideration of which, God forgives, justifies, and receives sinners into favour, or grants them a right to life, since this is only the righteousness of Jesus Christ, without them, imputed to them, and accepted by them through faith alone. Thus the English divines who subscribed Daniel Williams' book. If these things are spoken in sincerity and faithfully maintained as charity, which suspects nothing rashly, bids us believe, truly I do not see that much controversy as to this point can remain. Moroseness is not to be ascribed to virtue, nor should charity be violated under pretense of defending the truth. It is like the severity of a pedagogue to examine all speeches by human formulas. Men of a liberal genius refuse to be loaded with the fetters of rigid critics, whom they consider the offspring of deformity. Since the scripture describing the relation of faith to justification calls it neither an instrument nor a condition, he may be as orthodox who uses neither word as he who uses one or both. My judgment is this, he who acknowledges that it is the righteousness of Christ only wherein we stand before God, that it is received by faith, that it may be ours, and that thus we are justified by faith, not by any worthiness or causality of faith as they speak, much less by its merit or substitution in the place of perfect obedience, but by virtue of the gracious appointment of God, whereby he determined that for the sake of Christ's righteousness he would justify believers. God forbid that I should impeach such a divine with heterodoxy on this account, that he perhaps chooses rather to call faith a condition of justification, while I consider it as an instrument. End of chapter 10《Chapter 11 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Whether Repentance Precedes the Remission of Sins but this also deserves consideration, whether sorrow for sin, penitence, and repentance, or a purpose to live according to the will of God, go before justification and remission of sins as a disposing condition, prerequisite on the subject. And here the simplicity of Scripture is far more acceptable to me than all the subtleties of the schools which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith. Doubtless the matter stands thus. As soon as a principle of new life is infused into the adult person by the Spirit of grace, immediately spiritual acting of every kind springeth up from that principle, actions so pervading and exciting one another, that so mingled in their exercise, that they can scarcely be distinguished in practice, and as difficult is it to determine which is first in time, which last. Surely it is not possible, but that the soul quickened by the Spirit should, in that supernatural light wherewith it is illuminated, both see itself defiled and undone with innumerable sins, and see Christ full of grace, truth, and salvation. 
such a view cannot but cause both that with shame and sorrow it be displeased with itself and with ardent desire be carried out unto christ hence arises the receiving and accepting of christ that it may be delivered from the filthiness and guilt of its sins now it cannot receive him for justification except at the same time it received him for sanctification nor receive him as a priest to expiate sin unless it also receive him as a king to whom it may submit in order to obedience whence it follows that the act of faith whereby we receive christ for righteousness cannot be exercised without either a previous or at least a concomitant repentance and a purpose of a new life if therefore faith go before justification as we have lately asserted the same must be said of repentance springing up together with it from the same principle of spiritual life further this penitence and repentance may be considered two ways either as it is a privilege of the covenant of grace and the fruit of christ's merits and thus according to the divine dispensation in the order of nature at least it goes before that other privilege of personal justification and the actual forgiveness of sins or as it is man's duty and so required by god as an act to be performed by him in order to obtain pardon not that it anyhow merits pardon or gives any one a right to pardon but that at least it shows the man that he is effectually called and regenerated is in that state to which alone pardon is promised i rather choose to stop here than to trouble myself and others with the unprofitable subtleties of vexatious disputes for in this matter the highest honour is done both to the free grace of God and to evangelical piety, and at the same time the mouth of calumny is stopped. End of chapter 11of conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in britain under the unhappy names of antinomians and neonomians by herman witsius this librivox recording is in the public domain the explication of certain paradoxes the last question now remains wherein many things concur which are not wont to be heard and which need the clearest explication lest they be understood amiss and the first indeed that concerning the remission of all sins at once not only of the past and present but also of the future is abundantly clear of itself for since all the sins of believers were wholly translated to christ and he made satisfaction for them hence learned men in their discourses conclude with propriety that in justification which is the application of christ's satisfaction it is declared to believer that satisfaction has been made for all their sins and consequently that there are none at all whether past or to come which can be imputed to them for their condemnation balaam said in so many words that god does not behold iniquity in jacob nor see perverseness in israel numbers thirty three twenty one in this sense according to their judgment god surely sees by his omniscience whatever is done amiss by any he sees also the sins of believers as the sins of believers inasmuch as they are committed by them for whatever is true god sees that it is true but at the same time he does not see the sins of believers as the sins of believers inasmuch as they are no more theirs but christ's to whom they were imputed and who hath now satisfied for them they suggest that the spot and deformity of sin may be considered as twofold either in relation to sanctification or to justification they teach that believers are so defiled with it under the first consideration that even their best duties if compared with the perfection of the divine law are nothing but dung but in the last respect since christ took all sin from the elect upon himself and rendered them pleasing and acceptable unto god they deny that believers by any pollution of their sins become abominable to him or fall from his justifying favour in one respect they affirm and in another deny that a justified man brings new guilt upon himself if he fall into any enormous crime they affirm it as to fact so that he is convinced in his conscience and bound to confess before god that he has committed such a crime to the denial or in excuse of which he can adduce nothing and that according to the threatening of the law he deserves eternal destruction they deny it as to the sentence of a justifying god whereby the man being absolved from all his sins it is impossible that a condemnatory sentence should be pronounced for this new sin therefore to use the scholastic gloss they affirm it concerning potential guilt and deny it as to actual 
and their opinion they illustrate by the example of a man who being guilty of sedition or of treason confesses before the tribunal his fault and that he is worthy of punishment but in the meantime has in his possession a writ of pardon granted him by the clemency of the prince that seems a strange assertion which they have expressed in these words that it is the voice of a lying spirit who tells believers that they have sins which waste the conscience and which lie upon them as a burden heavier than to be borne and that david while he complained of that did not speak truly they explain their meaning however in the following manner that christ took the burden of our sins upon himself bore them and in bearing carried them away so that no believer can be burdened with it to destruction or to despair and his conscience so wasted that it should truly testify god is not pacified towards him that in david asaph heman job and other saints those things which in the height of temptation and from a failure of faith they speak incautiously concerning the goodness of God, must be distinguished from those which they declare from a principle of lively faith after they have recovered. Examples of which are so obvious, to such as are skilful in the Scriptures, that they need no further enlargement. Concerning the injury and the hurt done by sin, they speak in the following manner. Sin, if considered in its own nature, is the root from whence the most destructive fruits arise, and its wages is death, and none should be reckoned so small that it does not deserve the eternal torments of the spirits in prison. And it is proper that these things be under the view of believers, as often as with its feigned and deceitful fawning it allures them to commit it. For then it is the most dreadful of all things, inasmuch as it crucified our dearest Lord Jesus." but the sins of believers who have god for their merciful father do them no real injury neither is there any reason why they should be afraid of it for real injury is punishment properly so called and some part of condemnation which christ has entirely taken away from his people by bearing all that is terrible in sin he hath destroyed sin and made it that believers have no more to fear from it than from a dead lion which they protest they by no means affirm concerning sin when it fawns and allures, but concerning sin committed, which lies on the conscience of believers, and tempts them to deny both the free grace and love of God, and the all-sufficiency of Christ's merits. When they deny that God is offended by any sin of a justified person, however great, they again desire that to be understood in respect of the most plenary reconciliation which Christ has obtained, and which in justification is adjudged to believers for thus they teach god is not offended without cause there is no cause of offence except sin christ bore and carried away all the sins of believers and the most just offence given to god on their account and not some part of the offence only but the whole of the offences altogether therefore no part remains which can lie upon believers unto them god says fury is not in me isaiah twenty seven four with respect to the confession of sins their opinion is this that it is just, comely, and necessary to the end that God may be glorified, Joshua 7.19, as the only saviour of miserable men, and that the necessity, dignity, and efficacy of Christ's merits may be acknowledged. Yet they deny that confession of sins is the cause whereby remission is procured, or even the assurance of it. He who is truly a believer has as much foundation for quietness of mind concerning the remission of his sin before confession as after it. The only ground of assurance is the word of grace, I, even I, am he who blotteth out thy transgression for mine own sake. The verity and the value of that word, once pronounced in justification, abideth for ever. It belongs to faith to apprehend that word, and to apply it to itself for assurance, not to expect it by solemn confession as a certain prerequisite. For confession itself, unless it proceed from the faith of this word, cannot be acceptable to God. They acknowledge a sense of sin in order to holy humiliation of mind and sincere penitence to be a duty of very imperfect piety, but they contend that it arises much more easily and to better purpose from the faith of pardon already obtained than from any other source. From when Christ shows himself in all the benignity of his most precious grace to the sinful soul and of his own accord, pardons so many and so grievous sins, it melts much more easily and more purely into the most copious tears of sincere penitence than when it has to struggle with unbelief and despondency. With respect to daily prayers for the remission of sins, they have taught as follows. 
and universal remission of sins is given in justification, for which, as already given, thanks should be returned to God. But remission of sins sometimes signifies its manifestation to the conscience, in the continual communication of new favours, in the pleasures of God's love, in beholding the light of his countenance, and in the shining of the soul which arises from the rays of the sun of righteousness, beaming forth and bringing healing. These are things which deserve all the ardour of daily prayers. Yet so that we believe we have them in Christ together with all spiritual benefits, and that out of his fullness and not for the sake of our prayers we shall receive them from God. Thus far I have given an account of the brethren's judgment with as much fidelity, accuracy, and perspicuity as I could. End of chapter 12、Chapter、Chapter Chapter 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 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Our judgment concerning these paradoxes. Now I may be allowed to subjoin my own, which, all uncomely words being banished, shall flow in a gentle stream from the clear fountain of Scripture. And first, indeed, that is confessed among all the Orthodox, which we have now several times asserted, viz. that our Lord Jesus Christ satisfied divine justice to the full. For all the sins of all the elect, who inasmuch as they themselves were to exist, all their sins as future were without any difference, present to God and Christ. And so, Christ dying, they were equally blotted out in one day, and in testimony of full payment, the discharge was in a public and solemn manner given him at his resurrection. Now, in justification, not some part but the whole right purchased by Christ is adjudged to every believer. The whole of his righteousness is imputed to deliver them from all condemnation and to give them the sure hope of eternal salvation. And consequently, not only past sins are pardoned on that condition, that if they mean to be saved, they commit none afterward, or if they happen to commit them, that they must be solicitous concerning the new expiation of recent sins, but the pardon of all sins perfectly expiated by the one sacrifice of Christ is pronounced to them, none remaining or to remain, which shall bring them into condemnation and deprive them of eternal life. For this is the promise of the covenant of grace I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Hebrews 8:12 It is the privilege of believers that in Christ they have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Ephesians 1 7, not of some only, but of all, without exception. For Christ, by his own blood, hath obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews 9 12. That is, its merit and efficacy endureth for ever, and extends as much to future sins as to them that are past. If it were otherwise, none could receive solid comfort from justification. For what doth it profit me to know that only the sins which I have hitherto committed are pardoned, while every moment I sin and bring new debt upon myself? Must not the soul be equally solicitous who is conscious to itself that one sin, even the least, while not pardoned, is sufficient to exclude it from heaven? Now, upon what foundation is the believer assured of the remission of past sins? Upon no other, surely, but that they were laid upon Christ, borne by him, and taken away. Which is not true as to past sins only, but also as to future. For, as I just now hinted, when Christ satisfied for them, they were all equally future in respect of us who now live. What reason then forbids, yea, what does not enjoin the believer to be persuaded that sins to come shall no more be imputed to him under condemnation than the past, since Christ by the same blood and death expiated the former no less than the latter? Paul is very express with regard to this matter in the eighth of Romans. There is no condemnation, he says, no, not any, to them who are in Christ Jesus. No sin at all which shall bring them into condemnation. Believers may be sacredly secure, even as to the future, for he who spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? When he says all things, surely he does not accept the pardon of sins which we shall daily commit. For thus he goes on, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifieth, who absolves from every sin. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ who died, and by dying satisfied fully for all sins, having torn the handwriting on the cross. Yea, rather, who is risen again, having received from the Father the discharge of the satisfaction which he made. 
which is of service not only to him, that he may not again be arrested, but also to the debtors, for whom he is as a surety satisfied, who is even at the right hand of God, whither he could not have come himself unless he had first purged our sins by himself, Hebrews 1.3, and after that, by one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified, Hebrews 10.12-14, who also maketh intercession for us, demanding, according to covenant, that the right he purchased for us be also thoroughly applied. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? By bringing us into such a sin whereby we may fall from his love. For no other way can be imagined whereby either man or angel or even any other creature can separate us from the love of Christ, but by the instrumentality of sin. Since these things are so, it should not be reckoned a paradox, but is most evidently a true assertion that in justification that sentence is pronounced to the believer, whereby he is assured that satisfaction was made for all his sins, past, present, and to come, without exception, that none remains, whether already committed or to be committed afterwards, which shall ever bring him into condemnation. I cannot sufficiently admire that there should be found a reformed French divine who imputes this opinion, as remote from the sentiments of our churches, to a few divines, perhaps in Holland, who have been suddenly seized with an unreasonable desire after singular opinions. From which odium even Calvin alone ought to acquit them, whose memorable words on this subject are found in Institutes, Lib. 3, Chapter 11, Section 11 because it is more than sufficiently known by experience that the remainders of sin continue always in the just, they must needs be far otherwise justified than reformed to newness of life. For this last, God so begins in his elect and advances gradually and sometimes slowly in it through the whole course of life, that they may always be afraid lest they fall into condemnation at his tribunal. But he justifies them not in part, but that they may appear boldly in heaven as clothed with Christ's purity. For no portion of righteousness could pacify our consciences till they be satisfied that we please God because we are unexceptionably just before him. Hence it follows that the doctrine of justification is perverted and utterly overthrown when doubting is cast into souls, the assurance of salvation shaken, and free and undaunted prayer retarded, yea, when rest and tranquillity with spiritual joy is not established. See what follows, and it will appear that Calvin useth almost the same arguments with us. Of innumerable others, to Calvin I choose to add Charnock, a divine of recent memory in England, who in his meditations on Psalm 32, in the supplement to his works, page 107, speaks thus, Christ was made sin for us that he might take away all sin. Truly, it would have been an imperfect satisfaction if he had paid the interest and not the principal, or the principal and not the interest. There is no condemnation at all to them who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore, no guilt or cause of damnation left. Otherwise, Paul's challenge had been foolish, which God forbid, whereby he challenges the whole creation to lay any crime to the charge of God's elect. If even the least sin had remained unremitted, upon which either the justice of God or the severity of the law or the acuteness of conscience or the malice of the devil himself could have drawn up a charge. Since Christ came into the world for this purpose, that he might destroy the works of the devil, by which that wicked spirit had acquired a certain power over men, not any one sin indeed of the believer remained, for which he did not so satisfy that on that account the devil could claim the least right over a believer. Now let that author, otherwise very celebrated, go and contrary to all reason mark as a paradox a sentiment so much received and so clear that nothing occurs more frequently among the reformed writers of every nation. I hear him declaiming that it is contrary to all reason and unworthy of God to pardon beforehand sins not yet committed. But I wish that very wise man would tell me why it is less contrary to reason and less unworthy of Christ to satisfy beforehand for debts not yet contracted. But, says he, no father, no king, no prince ever came to such a degree of absurdity that while he pardons past sins, he should also forgive those which were to be perpetrated in time to come. I would not deny this, but who is so blind in matters of divinity as not to see the evident reason of the difference? When a father or a prince forgives a crime, he does it from mere favour without any satisfaction of any surety, who suffers the punishment due to all the crimes of the delinquent, whether past or future, 
but when God pardons past sins to one believing in Christ, and applying to himself all his merits in order to certain and complete salvation, he intimates at the same time that future sins shall not be imputed to him unto condemnation, because both rest upon the consideration of the ransom paid by Christ, as well for future sins as for past. He urges, there is no forgiveness of sins except after repentance. Now, repentance is that afterthought and after care which follows the commission of sins. Now, repentance is that afterthought and after care which follows the commission of sins. I answer that this general forgiveness of all sins, whereof we speak, is also preceded by the believer's universal sorrow, shame, and humiliation, not only on account of sins actually committed, but also because of that inherent perverseness of his nature, with which he must perpetually struggle, and from whence he foresees that many sins will proceed in time to come. This universal sorrow answers, in a certain proportion, to that universal justification. But if the justified person happens to bring himself again under the guilt of some atrocious sin, I believe that such is the order of God's clemency, that he does not specially apply that general sentence to the forgiveness of this particular sin, nor does he intimate it to the accusing, the upbraiding, and convincing conscience, in order to consolation, joy, and re-admittance into his fatherly familiarity, unless after a serious and suitable repentance for that sin, of which more immediately. Anthony Tuckney, once Regis Professor of Divinity in the College of Cambridge, has in a learned and judicious manner handled this controversy in his Prelections, question 13, page 118, etc., where he at once studies both truth and peace, as we also attempt, and shows that this problem may in a different sense be either affirmed or denied without the least injury to truth. But neither can it be denied that God does not see sin in the justified, since that is so often expressly asserted in Scripture. But it must be well understood, he does not so see it that he purposes on its account to condemn them. For, in this sense, he is said to cover their sins, to cast them behind his back, yea, to cast them into the depths of the sea, and that they may never come into his sight. Charnock's elegant observation on Psalm 32 in the supplement to his works, page 102, deserves its place and its praises here. A crossed book will not stand good in law because the crossing of the book implies the payment of the debt. Such a debt may perhaps be read, it cannot be demanded. Nothing hinders but that God may read pardoned sins in the book of his omniscience, but he will never charge them at the bar of his justice. God doth not altogether forget sin, for nothing slips out of his knowledge or memory. His not remembering sins is an act of his will rather than of his understanding. That forgetfulness is not natural but legal. God is not ignorant of the fact, but he removes the punishment and the fear of punishment by laying aside the memory of his wrath, not of his knowledge. He remembers as a father to chastise, not as a judge to condemn. Though sin be not imputed, yet it is inherent. Its being is not taken away, but its power is dethroned. It is taken away not as to the spot, but as to the guilt. Excellently, for surely God sees the sins of believers, he beholds them as a stain wherewith the soul is defiled, as blemishes wherewith a fair face is disfigured, as filthiness wherewith the beautiful robe of holiness is polluted, as a leprosy wherewith the whole man is infected, which David confessed when he desired to be purged with hyssop. And he sees them with remarkable displeasure, for he is not a God who hath pleasure in iniquity, no, not in that of those who are his own. He sees it also with anger and wrath, not in the wrath of a rigid and a condemning judge, but of a holy and an angry father. So he was angry with Aaron and Moses, though otherwise a pardoning God, angry with Miriam, as if a father had disdainfully spit on the face of a disobedient daughter angry with the church of his elect, which, with a patient mind, composed herself to bear the indignation of her heavenly father, Micah 7.9. His indignation rising sometimes to such a degree that he not only hides his pleasant face from them, stands afar and does not hear them when crying, but also smokes against their prayers the billows of his wrath passing over them. Yea, he seems to deal with them in a hostile manner, counts them as his enemies, writes bitter things against them, puts their feet in the stocks, sets a print upon their heels, the arrows of the Almighty are lodged in them, the poison whereof drinks up their spirit, and the terrors of God set themselves as in array against them. For all these are the very words of Scripture. See Isaiah 8, 17, Psalm 10, 1, 38, 32, 3, 88, 16, and 17, 
Job 13, 14, 6, 4. The famous Tuckney elegantly observes, in the place lately quoted, that notwithstanding that previous remission or justification, following sins, bring on particular guilt in itself, deserving eternal wrath, and so overwhelming the justified man, that it stirs up the fatherly anger of God against him, and makes him, though not a son of wrath, yet a son under wrath. I confess indeed that Job, Heman, and other holy men did not always set proper bounds to their complaints. None, however, will affirm this to me, that they had no cause at all for such great complaints, at least their complaining was not rebellion. And, though it be disagreeable to examine their several expressions, and to weigh them in the balance of the most accurate perfection, yet they all show under what vehement indignation of their Heavenly Father the justified themselves may sometimes fall. So far is it from being true that sins do them no harm. For, besides that, on their account, they deserve to be in all respects forsaken of God and disinherited, in the very act they disturb peace of conscience and take away the boldness and the full persuasion of faith, lessen the joy of salvation, grieve the spirit of grace, hurt the spiritual life, greatly diminish the habits of Christian virtues. As to the facility and promptitude of acting, and sometimes bring on a vehement swooning of the soul, which would choke the very principle of spiritual life, unless the guilt being removed by the blood of Christ, his quickening spirit graciously repelled their deadly influence. As I am not averse to inculcate that there are no sins of the justified which can bring them into condemnation, so I would wish with no less seriousness to put the justified in mind that the power of sin is pestilential, which they themselves will sometimes find, not indeed unto death, but to sickness, nigh unto death, and to torments similar to those which arise from the breaking of the bones. Chamia, against the calumnies of Bellamine, thus explains the opinion of the Orthodox Church. Panstrat, Volume 3, Book 15, Chapter 2, Section 12. We say that all sins hurt, even these which are forgiven, yea, that they are not forgiven except they hurt. They do not indeed prevent the obtaining of salvation, as blasphemy, lying, and adultery did not cause that Paul, Peter, and David should be damned, because forgiveness intervened. But to say that they do no hurt is madness, for there is no evil which does not hurt, because it would not be evil if it did not hurt. But sin, even when forgiven, is an evil, and it would not be forgiven except were it evil. Therefore sin is hurtful even when forgiven. This Paul knew that Paul, who, according to the papists themselves, was assured of the forgiveness of his sins, at least he himself professed so. But I obtained mercy, says he, yet he cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Could he be wretched if sin did him no harm? Neither indeed is it true that the justified have no need of grief, repentance, confession, and prayers, in order to obtain the pardon of sins, which are of daily infirmity, as Tertullian speaks or also of atrocious crimes if they are committed. For, though I asserted above that all sins are pardoned at once in the first justification, yet that general pardon contains its more special periods and degrees. Hence it is that that universal sentence is applied to particular cases by the Spirit of God himself, without which the mind, conscious of recent guilt, is in a storm. Hence it also is that the Heavenly Father sometimes removes the heavy rod of correction, and laying aside his indignation, readmits the confessing sinner into familiar fellowship. These things are everywhere in Scripture called the remission of sins, which all Scripture, together with the perpetual experience of believers, teach not to be attainable except in the way of repentance, confession, and frequent prayer. Yea, I would wish this also to be considered, that pious men, and such as in exercises of their devotion, were under the singular direction of the Spirit, have sought the forgiveness not of recent sins only, but have also, by repeated confession, put God and themselves in remembrance of their oldest sins, committed in their childhood, that what sins they had believed and experienced to be pardoned of old, these they may now again perceive to be truly forgiven them, by the renewed tokens of the divine favour which is excellently observed by Calvin Institutes, Book 3, Chapter 20, Section 19, where, quoting David's prayer, in which he asks that God would not remember the sins of his youth, Psalm 25, 7, he thus goes on, where we also see that it is not enough that every day we call ourselves to account for recent sins, unless they, which might seem to have been long forgotten, return to our memory. For the same prophet, having elsewhere confessed one grievous offence, returns on this occasion even to his mother's womb, wherein he had long ago contracted the infection. 
not that he might extenuate his guilt from the depravity of nature, but that heaping up all the sins of his life, he might find God the more easy to be entreated by how much he was severer in condemning himself. I know that there is a certain humiliation and melting of heart into the sweetest tears of repentance arising from a sense of divine love, but I know also that there is a humiliation and a melting which are previous to that sense. I know that none of these is to be reckoned among meritorious causes or conditions, or as if by their own powers they obtain remission. But on that the controversy does not turn. It is not sufficient that God pre-requires them in man, yet not without his grace, previous to the grant of further grace. I know that they cannot please God except they proceed from faith. But I know this also that something may be of faith which is not from the assurance and sense of pardon already obtained. He also acts from faith, who, believing that there is the fullest remission of sins in the satisfaction and merits of Christ, betakes himself thither, that he likewise may obtain to his own salvation what he hath learned from the gospel, his promise to all believers. In fine, I know that the word of the gospel is the surest foundation of our certainty of the remission of sins, but I know this also, that sincere penitence is to us a certain evidence that the word of grace pertains to us, for none knows this but he who repents of his sin." I conclude this chapter with the warmest wishes that these detestable words may henceforth be banished, and that it may never be heard from the mouth of any reformed divine to the dishonour and reproach of our most holy religion, that sin does no manner of hurt to believers, and that a believer, immediately after committing the most atrocious crime, is as much assured of pardon as he can be after the deepest humiliation. End of chapter 13《Chapter 14 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerning the Covenant of Grace I see the following things controverted concerning the Covenant of Grace. 1. Whether it consists entirely in that eternal compact between the Father and the Son as the representative head of all the elect, whereby the Son undertook, according to the will of the Father, to do all things worthy of the divine perfections, that the elect might obtain salvation in a manner becoming God, or whether there must also be acknowledged a certain compact between God and the elect, concerning the manner whereby they may actually become partakers of the salvation purchased by Christ. 2. Whether Christ so took upon himself all the conditions of the covenant of grace, that no condition at all is required, or can be required, of the elect, to be performed by the grace of God through the merit of Christ prior to the actual possession of salvation. I find so many things here in which the brethren agree that provided party zeal and the obstinacy of defending what has once been said were laid aside, I would hope that little controversy would remain concerning the subject itself. If I am not mistaken, both parties agree in this, that they acknowledge the wonderful compact between the Father and the Son concerning procuring the salvation of the elect, wherein the Son represented them all, being to do these things for them, which otherwise it was incumbent on them to do. Nay, I also trust impartial judges will grant me that they acknowledge there is a certain federal transaction between God and the elect concerning the manner wherein they are to please God and to enjoy happiness though perhaps they will not yet acknowledge that it should be comprehended in the definition of the covenant of grace. For such a federal transaction is so often and so expressly taught in Scripture that it would not seem it can be called in question. Such a covenant God made with Abraham and with his seed, Genesis 17. Where, having first said that he is God all-sufficient, he requires that he walk continually before him and be perfect. Again he promises that he will be a God to him and to his seed after him, but he also requires that he keep his covenant, for the confirmation of which he gives him the sign of circumcision, as a seal of the righteousness of faith. What solemn federal transactions between the Israelites and God are often on record, which indeed I do not deny may be called national, yet it is so far from being true that they contained anything opposite to the genius of the covenant of grace, that is, on the contrary, they implied and supposed that covenant, at least in respect of the elect, of whom it is said, Psalm 55, Gather me my favourites, who have made a covenant with me upon a sacrifice. And Psalm 103, 17 and 18, The mercy of the Lord is towards such as keep his covenant. Isaiah 24, 5, They make void the everlasting covenant. 
and Jeremiah 55, they shall join themselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant, which shall not be forgotten. I omit a great many other things of the like nature which I do not now choose warmly to urge. Only I contend at present that they evince in general that besides the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son, there is a certain covenant made in time betwixt God and the elect. It is also confessed that the true condition of the covenant of grace, and properly so called, whereby it is chiefly distinguished from the covenant of works, is this, that all that righteousness upon which the right to life is entirely founded be performed by the mediator and surety of the covenant, from whence it follows that this righteousness of the surety being admitted, no condition properly so called can be required of the elect, whereby they may acquire freedom from punishment or a right to life. Nay, also, all grant this, that the apostle often designs the covenant of grace under the name of a testament, now the testament is the unchangeable will of God, suspended on no condition, which, having all its strength from the death of the testator, cannot be suspended on any condition to be performed by man, especially since in the same testament God hath provided no less concerning the faith and holiness of the heirs than concerning salvation itself. Hence it is that the form of the covenant consists sometimes of mere promises, Jeremiah 31, 33, and 32, 38, 39, and 40. Neither is it controverted that these very things, which in a certain respect are called conditions by some, belong in another to the benefits of the covenant. For in the same covenant God promises repentance, faith, the beginning, progress, and uninterrupted continuation of the new life, no less than its blessed consummation, as appears from Jeremiah's prophecies just now quoted. It is also certain that in the greatest wisdom and holiness God has so appointed that none should obtain salvation except in the way of faith and sanctification, and has arranged his promises in that order, that the further and more perfect good should pertain to none but to him who should already be partaker of the antecedent promises. For it is impossible that any should please God without faith, or see him without holiness. In fine, it cannot be denied that Scripture sometimes exhibits the form of the covenant of grace in a conditional style. Romans 10, 8 and 9. This is the word of faith which we preach. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. John thirteen seventeen. If ye know these things, happy shall ye be if ye do them. Again, 14.23, If any man love me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. And so often elsewhere, and in this sense some condition is to be admitted in the covenant of grace, inasmuch as it signifies a duty, according to the will of God, to be performed by man, in a manner agreeable to the nature of that covenant, before he enter upon the possession of consummate salvation. If in all these things there be an agreement, as I hope there will, strange brethren, what is it concerning which you contend on this head? In place of a supplement, I choose to subjoin the most excellent Chamia's opinion on this controversy of which let the learned judge. Disputing in his Panstrat, volume 3, book 15, chapter 3, against Bellamine, he teaches that the true and determinate difference between the law of works and that of faith is the condition of works and of faith that is, that the law of works proposes salvation upon condition of performing the law, but the law of faith proposes it upon condition only of believing in Christ. Lest, however, he should leave anything unexplained, he observes that conditions in contracts are of two kinds, some of which may be called antecedent, others consequent. He calls these antecedent, which give rise to the contract, according to the maxim I give that thou mayest give, as when one sells a field for a certain sum of money, but the consequent conditions are added to the antecedent as following from them, which indeed are mutual between the parties, but oblige the one only, so that the other is bound to do no more on their account, as if one, having given or sold a plot of land, should assign an annuity to be laid out upon the poor. Now conditions of that kind, when not performed, usually disannul the contract, and yet they do not constitute it. Nay, there would be no annuity unless the sale were already full and complete. This distinction, that very learned divine, applies to the present purpose in the following manner. The law of works requires the fulfilling of the law as an antecedent condition, without which not only no man can enter upon the possession of eternal life, but cannot so much as have a right to it. But the law of faith does not admit of works as a condition in this sense, but only in the other, 
viz. that by virtue of the life already given through faith, works are necessary, so that he who shows no works falls from every right which he had, or rather seemed to have on account of his external vocation, although otherwise works are not the causes of the life to be given. Thus far, Charmia, compare Tuckney in his Theological Prelections, page 233. End of chapter 14. Chapter 15 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Paradoxical Assertions Concerning the Utility of Holiness With respect to the utility of holiness and good works, I find the following things disputed. Whether it be justly said... 1. That good works are of no profit to us in order to the possession of salvation, so that though they are acknowledged not to be the cause of reigning, they cannot be reckoned even the way to the kingdom, that whatever good we do, we do it not for ourselves but for Christ, that nothing is to be done that we may live but because we do live. 2. That it is unlawful to do any good with the intention that by doing it we may promote our own salvation. 3 that there is no duty of virtue or holiness, however perfectly performed, whereby we can gain even the least good to ourselves, either in this life or in that which is to come. For that no evil or hurt can be avoided by so doing, neither can peace of conscience nor joy in the Holy Ghost, nor assurance of the remission of sins, nor consolation be promoted in this way. For that the exercise of holiness and good works is not to be reckoned a proper and even a sufficient evidence and argument that we are in a state of grace, and in the certain expectation of glory. 5. That even the sincere holiness of believers, proceeding from the Spirit of grace, is in its exercise filthiness and dung before God, and that consequently he who studies holiness with all the diligence he can, is not a whit more pleasing and acceptable to God than if he neglected it, or indulged himself in vice. Truly these things are so unusual in the very sound of the words, and so unexpected from the mouth of a Christian, much less from his who is reputed a teacher of evangelical holiness, and professes and exercises it in piety of life, that they cannot but strike horror into the hearers, and fill their minds with strong prejudices against the teacher and the doctrine. But it must also be confessed that the horror will be not a little diminished when we hear the learned man himself and those who are on his side explaining their mind more at large, which indeed is very necessary to the decision of the controversy. Let us therefore now attend them. They teach in general that it is so far from being possible to separate holiness and good works from salvation that they are a part of the salvation purchased for us by Christ, for we are created in him under good works. They add that the ends of good works are very remarkable, namely the manifestation of our obedience and subjection, the promoting of the glory of the grace of God, in this that we endeavour to be useful to others, the edification of our neighbour, the gathering of ourselves together unto Christ Jesus, who hath promised that he will be found in them. Besides, they put us in mind that, in all these assertions, the only end they propose is that the glory of free justification may remain entire to God and Christ, and that no justifying virtue may be attributed to our works of whatsoever kind. Having premised these general observations, they explain these several assertions much in this manner. 1. There is no believer under heaven to whom it is given to ascend the celestial heights until he has in his generation served the purpose of God. None believes in Christ and receives him by faith who is not after that reception created in him to good works, that he may walk in them. Meanwhile, Christ is the only way to life. The practice of godliness is the necessary labour and occupation of those who walk in this way. Further, we do no good for ourselves, since all things requisite to salvation were abundantly performed for us by Christ, who alone died for all, that they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but to him who died for them and rose again. 2 Corinthians 5.15 the tenor of the legal covenant is, Do this, and thou shalt live. But the doctrine of grace is, Christ hath quickened thee, therefore do thou live in the life of the Son of God, and testify it by a holy activity. Secondly, God hath blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Neither is there a more certain assurance of salvation to be found elsewhere than in Christ, who finished it most perfectly for us. 
If therefore we seek to finish it for ourselves, what do we else but that which is already done, labouring in vain? Besides, the generous spirit of true Christianity is far from all mercenary meanness. Neither does it teach thus, I will carefully addict myself to the exercise of good works that I may gain the eternal reward, but rather in this manner the lines have fallen unto me in pleasant places, I have a goodly heritage, goodness and mercy shall follow me all my days, and because Christ has provided so abundantly for me, hence contented with so great opulence, and seeking nothing further by my own works, I will glorify him in my body and my spirit, and serve my generation to the glory of his grace. Thirdly, our duties, even the best and most excellent, have no efficacy of themselves to do us any good. All efficacy depends upon the blessing of God in Christ. Therefore it must be inculcated that we can ward off no evil by our prayers, or any other exercises of religion, lest, as is generally the case, we attribute unto them any power to reconcile us to God, which lies in the satisfaction of Christ alone. In fine, what do our works avail to peace of conscience and joy in Christ? Which, if we attend to their imperfection and the pollution wherewith they are defiled, proclaim nothing but war, the blood of Christ only proclaimeth peace, which you seek in vain elsewhere. He is our peace. Fourthly, the principal evidences whereby it appears that we are in Christ are reckoned by many to be these, universal obedience, sincerity of heart and love towards the brethren, but though these in their own kind and within their own sphere are of remarkable use to this purpose, yet because they are weakened by the flesh they are scarcely sufficient to give solid assurance to the soul. For there is no man, provided he attend to himself, but will easily find that they are all subject to so great blemishes that the soul, solicitous concerning its own salvation, has a difficulty to satisfy itself in discerning these marks. The Spirit of the Lord must first reveal His grace to our spirit, and endue us with faith, whereby we may receive that testimony of the Divine Spirit, that, content with it, we may quiet our heart before any duty of holiness can give evidence of a matter of such importance. But after the testimony of the Divine Spirit, received by faith, hath produced assurance in the soul, then the gifts of the Divine Spirit, together with the Spirit of the Lord, and the heart of the believer, bear witness." Fifthly, when Paul testifies, Philippians 3, 8, that he counts all things but loss and dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, and that he might gain Christ, by these words he excludes, as to justification before God, all works, whether previous to faith or following it, as is excellently observed by Beza, for the elucidation of which point it is proper to make the following remarks. 1. The graces of the sanctifying spirit flow clear and pure from their fountain. 2. But running through the channels of our hearts infected with corruption, from their own filth they contract uncleanness. 3. And hence it is that all our best duties and exercises are polluted. 4. And consequently they cannot be reckoned for our righteousness before God's tribunal. 5. There is therefore no reason why we should glory in duties well performed, or on their account commend ourselves to God, but that rather being covered with shame we should implore pardon. 6. Whatever proceeds from us, compared with the most immaculate holiness of God, and in respect of the imperfection cleaving to it, arising from a mixture of sin dwelling in us, causes the duties performed by us, if considered in themselves, are nothing but dung. 7. Nevertheless, by faith in Christ, all the filthiness of our sins is washed away by Him, who presents to God these duties cleansed by His blood alone, and makes them pleasing and acceptable to Him, which... He does not, except we entirely renounce ourselves and our own righteousness, and count it all but loss and dung. 8. In fine, since we ourselves and the spiritual sacrifices which we offer unto God are not acceptable to Him but by Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 2, five. it is unlawful to presume so much upon our own holiness, however great, as to ask that on its account, considered in itself and separately from Christ, we may please God. End of chapter 15《Chapter 16 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius, translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Doctrine of Scripture Concerning the Utility of Holiness 
much after this manner the learned men explain their mind which appears with quite another face when the hideous visit of the most rugged phrases is torn off truly i cannot sufficiently admire why the learned men took a pleasure so as to express themselves that nothing but stones seemed to speak the ruggedness of which piled up in one well nigh broke the brains of all the hearers by such a conduct they very badly consulted not only their own character but also the whole of the reformed religion which very imprudently and without any other probable cause is exposed to the cavils and calumnies of adversaries not very long ago anthony arnold the celebrated patriarch of the jansenists attempted to throw an odium on the doctrine of the reformed churches as hostile to piety and good works namely lest he should by any means be thought to be on calvin's side Hence he took for a pretext some of the most innocent expressions of our divines, which by the most unjust interpretation he wrested to a wrong purpose. What would he not have done if these unusual phrases, and such as are similar to them, had come under his review, and if he had known that their authors were teachers in the Reformed Church? And I am afraid truly, lest he may have done it, at least in part. See si Giurio Justificat della Morale, Book 3, Chapter 2 what an unhappy thing it is so to speak and that of determined purpose that immediately you need a tedious explication before simple and candid hearers and an apology before the less favourable and the suspicious since perspicuity is the chief ornament of speech what hindered but that omitting all these turnings and windings in obscurity you spoke clearly from the very beginning what you might hope would immediately approve itself to the conscience of pious men but let these things suffice at present as to the harshness of phrases in the matter itself there is that i approve and what i disapprove i approve indeed of the scope of all this doctrine which has this for its object that men may be called off from all presumption upon their own righteousness and trained up to the exercise of general piety which flows from the pure fountain of divine love but i do not equally approve that it seems at least in a great degree to take from good works all that fruit and utility so frequently assigned to them in scripture free justification is so to be consulted that nothing be derogated from the benefit of sanctification and as the oracles of the divine spirit which speak of the former are to be explained according to their utmost emphasis lest the merits of christ alone be anyhow diminished so those which treat of the latter are not to be extenuated by natural interpretations we must accurately distinguish between a right to life and the possession of life. The former must so be assigned to the obedience of Christ that all the value of our holiness may be entirely excluded. But certainly our works, or rather these which the Spirit of Christ worketh in us and by us, contribute something to the latter. And here again that excessive rigidity of disputation is inconsistent with the moderation and mildness of the Scriptures, which I shall show distinctly and in order first scripture teacheth that man must do something that he may obtain the possession of the salvation purchased by christ labour said he for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life which indeed he interprets afterwards of faith but so that there he plainly reduces it to the catalogue of works for justification is not the subject john six twenty seven to twenty nine and paul expressly says work out your own salvation with fear and trembling philippians two twelve and again therefore my brethren be ye steadfast immovable always abounding in the work of the lord for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the lord one corinthians fifteen fifty eight neither because christ is the way to life is the practice of christian piety therefore not the way to life christ is the way to life because he purchased us a right to life the practice of christian piety is the way to life because thereby we go to the possession of the right obtained by christ for it is more than a hundred times designed by the name of life again the way of righteousness the good way the way of peace yea that nothing might be wanting it is called the way of life and salvation proverbs six twenty three the commandment is a lamp and the law is light and reproofs of instruction are the way of life and ten seventeen he is in the way unto life who keepeth instruction fifteen twenty four the way of life is above to the wise psalm fifty twenty three whoso ordereth his way i will cause him to enjoy the salvation of god and what does christ himself understand by that narrow way which leadeth unto life matthew seven fourteen but the strict practice of christian religion 
which is called the way of salvation, Acts 16.17. It is certain indeed that the true Christian lives to Christ, that is, to his glory, but it does not follow from thence that he does nothing for his own advantage. It is not contrary to the duty of a holy man to desire life, love days, and enjoy good, Psalm 34.13. Nor did Eliphaz the Temanite advise Job amiss, Pray, acquaint thyself with him, and be at peace, whereby good shall come unto thee. Job 22.21. Nor is it unlawful to anticipate how good it shall be for me if I live to Christ. It is good for me to draw near to God. Psalm 73.28. In fine, it is not inconsistent to do something from this principle because we live and to the end that we may live. No man eats indeed, but he lives, but he also eats that he may live. We both can and ought to act in a holy manner, because we are quickened by the Spirit of God, but we must also act in the same manner that that life may be preserved in us, may increase and at last terminate in an uninterrupted and eternal life. Moses said excellently of old, Deuteronomy thirty nineteen and 20, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set life and death before you. Therefore choose life, that thou mayest live, in loving the Lord thy God, obeying his voice, and cleaving unto him, for he is thy life. Deuteronomy 7, 1. Observe to do that ye may live. And chapter 30, verse 6. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, to love the Lord thy God, that thou mayest live. Truly these speeches are not legal, but evangelical. Secondly, a mercenary baseness is certainly unworthy of the high-born sons of God, but their heavenly Father does not forbid them to have any regard to their own advantage in the exercise of holiness. He not only permits but also willeth that by a patient and continuance in well-doing we seek for glory and honour and immortality, and to them who do so he will render eternal life, Romans 2, 6 and 7. And though he requires us to love him above all, yet he does not command that all love to ourselves be entirely banished. For we are not bound to love our neighbour and not to love ourselves. It is also just that the study of holiness be excited in us by this love to ourselves. For, pray, what is the end of all these promises whereby God hath commended his precepts to us, but that, stimulated with a desire after them, we might the more cheerfully obey him? Not to love the benefits promised is to condemn the goodness of God who promiseth. Not to be animated to piety through a desire after them is to abuse them to a purpose quite opposite to that for which they were designed of God. David himself confessed that the precepts of God were far more desirable than gold, yea, than fine gold, and sweeter than honey, and the honeycomb, even on that account, because in keeping them there is great reward. Psalm nineteen, ten, and 11. And the faith of Moses is commended, because he had respect to the recompense of the reward. Hebrews 11.26 Yea, that faith is required of all who come unto God, whereby they must believe that he is the rewarder of them who diligently seek him. Verse 6. But at the same time, this love to ourselves ought to flow from the love of God, be subordinate and referred to it. It is not lawful to love God for our own sake, so as to consider ourselves as the end and him as the means by the enjoyment of whom we are rendered happy. But since we are the property of God, whom we ought to love above all things, therefore we are also bound to love ourselves in relation to Him. Our good is therefore to be sought, that in it we may taste the sweetness of the Lord, and that His peculiar treasure may be so much the more increased. Thus love to ourselves shall at last be absorbed in the ocean of divine love. The subject itself obliges me to repeat here what I observed elsewhere. Thirdly, Neither is it agreeable to the perpetual tenor of the Scriptures that we reap no real advantage from duties rightly performed, that no evil is averted by prayers, fastings, and penitence, and that neither peace of conscience nor joy of heart are promoted by the exercise of virtue. Certainly this is contrary to the Mosaic doctrine, Deuteronomy 6.18. Do that which is right, that it may be well with thee. Add verse 3, He who followeth after righteousness and mercy shall find life. Righteousness and honour, saith the writer of Proverbs, chapter 21, 21. Paul tells us that godliness is great gain, and that it is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come, and that good works are good and profitable unto men. 1 Timothy 6, 6, 4, 8, Titus 3, 8. 
that impending calamities are averted by penitence, is taught of God, Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. And remarkable is Zephaniah's speech, chapter 2, verse 3, Seek the Jehovah, all the meek of the earth, who work his judgment. Seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be, ye shall be hid in the day of Jehovah's anger. Further, it is written in Isaiah, chapter 32, 17, that the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. In the same prophet we are also taught that if any cease to do evil and learn to do well, it shall come to pass that their sins, though as scarlet, shall be white as snow, and though red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Chapter 1, verses 16, 17, and 18. He also teaches that if any man rightly observe the Sabbaths of the Lord, he should delight himself in the Lord. Chapter 58, 13, and 14. When we believe the scripture asserting these things, we do not believe that the exercises of virtue or religion merit any such thing, or that the efficacy of these duties is so great that of themselves, setting aside the divine blessing, they can procure benefits or avert calamities. But we believe, so great is the goodness of our Heavenly Father, that for Christ's sake he liberally rewards the sincere endeavors of his children who rejoice to please him. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name. Hebrews 6.10 Fourthly, it is much more difficult to say what is controverted as to the evidences of grace than what should be determined according to Holy Scripture. For sometimes it seems to be denied that any inherent qualities are proper evidences of justification. Let not thy comfort, says one, depend on thy personal sanctification, because no certainty and constant consolation can flow from hence. Again, from the effects of sanctification, a man has reason to doubt in his own soul concerning justification, whereas no effect of sanctification can show the soul its justification. The soul which apprehends its justification in Christ not only knows it, but also lives by it, and enjoys its delicious fruits, peace, joy, and strengthening, without any sanctification in itself. Lest any, however, infer from hence that sanctification may be altogether separated from justification, it is immediately added, as we ought not to infer our justification from any effect of sanctification, so that apprehension of justification is not of God which withdraws a man from the means and the rules of sanctification, for it is uncomely not to walk in holiness according to the word of God. And sometimes it seems to be acknowledged that sanctification and its effects are in their kind remarkable evidences of justification, but not sufficiently convincing without the witness of the divine spirit. Things so intricate, who can explain? How much clearer here is the simplicity of the scriptures. It teaches a double way whereby a man may come to the certain knowledge of his state. The one depends on the illumination of divine grace alone, and on the most liberal witnessing of the Holy Spirit to our spirit, but the other is committed to our own diligence. What kind of witnessing of the Spirit they conceive and what they experience in their own souls, God and themselves know. I would not deny that there is a certain internal instinct, not to be explained by human language, which by a secret conviction of conscience assures the beloved of God concerning their justification and adoption. Nevertheless, since the ordinary dispensation of the gracious providence of God, which is common to all the elect, ought to be distinguished from those extraordinary revelations of the Spirit which were peculiar to the prophets, and since this witnessing of the Spirit of which we now treat consists not so much in words as in facts, it is credible that the Holy Spirit generally so works in the souls of believers that he excites their spirit, otherwise languishing, to the diligent observation of those qualities which are in the soul, and of those things which are done in it and by it, and irradiates the eyes of the mind with a super-celestial light, lest they should be deceived by things more specious than solid, or overlook those things which God hath taught in Scripture to be evidences of his grace. For the Spirit of God so beareth witness that he witnesseth together with our spirit in exciting it to bear a true testimony and in confirming its testimony and convincing the conscience of its truth. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, Romans 9, 1, and thus indeed even the witnessing of the divine spirit is not altogether separated from the observation of the signs of grace. And it often happens that the Spirit of God so embraces his elect with these allurements of his most beneficent love, that while they enjoy those spiritual and ineffable delights, which earthly souls neither receive nor taste, they are no less persuaded of their election and justification than if they saw their names engraven on the very hands of God. 
But Father, it is a part of our duty to study, to make our calling and election sure, 2 Peter 1.10, that is, to endeavor that by evident signs we may be persuaded of the love of God towards us. But how shall we obtain that? If we give all diligence to add to our faith fortitude, and to fortitude knowledge, etc. For if these things be in us and abound, they will make us that we shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Verses 5-9 to nine. Therefore, from a consciousness of Christian virtues, there arises in godly men an assurance of their election and vocation. And these virtues, as Bernard elegantly says in his book Concerning Grace and Free Will, are certain seminaries of hope, incentives of love, evidences of hidden predestination, and presages of future felicity. Paul also commands that every man examine and prove himself whether he be in the faith, and whether Jesus Christ be in him, 2 Corinthians 13.5. To the right performances of which examination it is necessary that first we be solidly taught from the word of God what are the distinguishing marks of a state of grace, then that we begin a diligent search of our own conscience, whether they can be found in us. If we consult the word of God, almost everywhere we find that the heirs of present grace and future glory are described by their qualities and virtues, and by the exercise of these. See, if you please, Psalm 15 and 24, and Matthew 5. Yea, in some places we are expressly taught that it is from hence that our state is to be known, 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. Again, in the 19th verse, and hereby we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. These words certainly signify something very different from and diametrically contrary to these assertions we lately heard. Since the learned men confess that sanctification is a consequence and an effect of justification, and such an effect indeed which is inseparable from a consciousness of justification, it is strange why they deny that it is a certain sign of justification. Cannot therefore the cause be known from its proper effects? From one of two inseparable benefits cannot the other be inferred? The brethren confess that none can have a consciousness of his justification but from faith and by faith. But how does any man know that he has faith? From the evidence of the thing, they say. For since the soul is immediately conscious to itself of its own actions, it knows whether it hears the testimony of God's Spirit, whether it receives it and by believing answers it. For faith is the echo and, as it were, a certain repercussion of the divine voice speaking to the soul. I do not choose to oppose. But pray, let them tell the reason why the soul is less conscious of its affection than of its assent. How comes it that I do not as well know that I frequently think with pleasure concerning God, that I eagerly desire and long after familiar communion with Him, and am solicitous to do what may be pleasing to Him, and in fine am grieved when I wander from the rule of duty, as that I know the sacred whispers of God to my soul is truly the voice of God, and that my soul by the assent of faith answers to it. Hence I conclude that sanctification and its effects are by no means to be slighted when we treat of assuring the soul as to its justification. Neither will it be improper to compare the assurance which is from the witnessing of the divine spirit with that which arises from discerning the evidences of grace. If the witnessing of the Holy Ghost be viewed in itself and known to be the testimony of the spirit himself, truly nothing surer than it, nothing more worthy of credit can be conceived which Chrysostom hath illustrated to excellent purpose, homily 14, in the pist ad Rome, u tu charismatos estin e phonen monon, ala que tu dontos tenorian paracletu, otane to pnefma martoer, pua lupon amphitholia, imen har anthropos e angelos e archangelos, E alatis tu afte dunamis tuto upisgnito can amphithalin en icos dinas. Tene anotatu usias tes que dores amen tuto kedion evherste marturuntes emin tis amphithetesi lupon perites axias. This, the voice not only of the gifts, but also of the comforter who bestows the gift. 
but when the spirit beareth witness pray what doubt can remain for if either man angel or archangel or any such power should promise this it might be proper to doubt but when the supreme being and he indeed who bestows this gift testifies to us even by these things which he hath commanded us to ask who pray can doubt of his fidelity i do not doubt but that the testimony of the spirit where it is present shines with such splendid rays of celestial light in the souls of believers that they are most fully persuaded it is god who speaks but i desire to hear from pious men how they experience that testimony in themselves whether by way of some constant act or intermitting indeed but very frequently repeated or whether they happen to enjoy these most pleasant whisperings more rarely and by long interruptions and intervals of time if they are perpetually or very frequently honoured with such pleasant and familiar intercourse they owe the greatest gratitude to god neither can any reason be assigned why others should envy them such extraordinary happiness but neither let them by rash judging be injurious to the generation of god's children to whom it is not vouchsafed to be so blessed that they can glory in such a frequent much less the uninterrupted witnessing of the spirit and whose faith is not generally the echo or repercussion of the internal whispers concerning the remission of their sins but an assent to the gospel as preached by christ and the apostles and committed to writing by the inspiration of the holy ghost but let us suppose it is of late that some believer has enjoyed such pleasant whispers of the spirit does the memory of it remain so deeply impressed on the mind that after a considerable time it will always be present in the soul with the same degree of light and that reasons of doubting do not now and then arise what if perhaps he deceived himself with his own imagination and took that for a dictate of the spirit which was nothing but a pleasant play of a deluded mind in the charge of souls which i have now borne upward of forty years i have often had occasion to hear doubts of that kind from those concerning whom i had no reason to think amiss but since the habits of christian virtues are permanent though not always active in the same degree and since therefore not their equal vivacity but sincerity is an evidence of grace in fine since it is not very difficult for a man to discern how he is affected towards god and from what principle and with what purpose he is engaged in the worship of god and the exercise of virtue i have generally found that more solid and permanent tranquillity arises from the perpetual study of preserving a good conscience than from the obscure remembrance of god speaking to the soul which does not used to be very frequent with the christians of our age blessed they who can say with paul our rejoicing is this the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity not in fleshly wisdom but by the grace of god we have had our conversation with the world two corinthians one twelve fifthly with respect to the beauty of christian virtues and their acceptableness in the sight of the lord i thus judge that none of this life obtains such perfect holiness but that it labours under its imperfections on account of which if god should deal with us according to the rigour of the law and his highest right over us it would be rejected hence it is that our righteousness can by no means have place before him in order to justification and if any should presume to obtrude it upon god for that very purpose truly it would be loss and dung to the man himself neither do the brethren differ here as to the substance of the matter for i see it is taught on both sides that it is incumbent as a duty even on the best of christians to renounce all the grace they possess and all the good they do as contributing nothing at all to the expiation of sins or to the obtaining of a right to life yea that they are condemned who deny that our most excellent obedience deserves the curse according to the rigour of law and stands in need of pardon or who neglect to inculcate on their hearers that all these things must be renounced which may be found in ourselves lest in any manner they be accounted the cause of the expiation or of the forgiveness of sins but when through the righteousness of christ apprehended by faith the believer's person is made acceptable to god then his virtues which he obtained by sanctifying grace and the exercise of virtues flowing from the same grace are likewise acceptable to god and what blemishes of ours cleave to them these are covered with the most perfect righteousness and holiness of christ in the meantime since that holiness to which we were predestinated by the father which christ purchased for us by his blood and which is infused into us by the efficacy of the holy spirit is true holiness and the very image of god according to which we are renewed it cannot but even in consideration of itself because it is holiness 
and as it is holiness please god and in this respect christian virtues are not filthiness and dung but the beauty of the royal bride and the comeliness wherewith she is all glorious within psalm forty five thirteen and fourteen holiness becometh the house of the lord for ever psalm ninety three five further since god cannot but love himself he also delights in that which is like him and the more of his image he discerns in anything the more he delights in it charnock on the holiness of god page five hundred and nine expresses himself with elegance god is so holy that he cannot but love holiness in others by his nature he cannot but love that which is agreeable to his nature and in which he finds the lovely draughts of his own wisdom and purity it is impossible that he should not be delighted with his own image he would not be holy by nature if he were not delighted with holiness in every nature he would deny his own nature if he did not love everything wherein the image of his nature is expressed so indeed that if the devils themselves were capable of an act of righteousness god by the purity of his nature would be inclined to love it even in those naughty and rebellious spirits hence it follows that they who diligently apply themselves to the exercise of christian holiness are as acceptable to him as they are odious who obey their lusts whatever others may think i do not doubt but that is a generous and a laudable emulation of christians whereby they endeavour to excel one another in the study of godliness that as they have been taught by the gospel how they ought to walk and to please god so they would abound more and more one thessalonians four one wherefore we labour that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him two corinthians five nine end of chapter sixteen Chapter 17 of Conciliatory or Irenical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In what manner and order the preaching of the law should accompany that of the gospel? Finally, it is required in what manner and order the preaching of the law should accompany that of the gospel. To the determination of which question we must first know what is understood by the law and what by the gospel. The law here signifies that part of the divine word which consists in precepts and prohibitions, with the promise of conferring a reward upon them who obey and a threatening of punishment to the disobedient. The gospel signifies the doctrine of grace and of the fullest salvation in Christ Jesus, to be received of elect sinners by faith. Therefore, every prescription of virtues and duties, all exhortations and dissuasions, all reproofs and threatenings, also all the promises of a reward in recompense of perfect obedience, belong to the law. But to the gospel appertains whatever can give a sinner the hope of salvation, namely the doctrine concerning the person, offices, states, and benefits of Jesus Christ, and all the promises wherein is included the pardon of sins, and the annexed possession of grace and glory, to be obtained by faith in him. This is the strictest notion of both words, to which we must attend, in the whole of this disputation. Otherwise, it is known to all who are acquainted with theology that the law is sometimes used in such an extensive signification that it contains the whole system of the doctrine of salvation, the better part of which is the gospel, Isaiah 2.3, 52.4, and that also the gospel sometimes signifies all that doctrine which Christ and the apostles delivered, in which are comprehended both commandments and prohibitions and upbraidings and threatenings, Mark 16.15, compared with Matthew 28.20, Romans 2.16. And the law in that strictest signification may be considered two ways, either as in itself or as subservient to some covenant. The law in itself is the most absolute rule of all duty to be performed by man in whatsoever state, so that the goodness or malignity of all rational actions without exception is to be examined by it. But it obtains another relation when it is subservient to some divine covenant, it served the covenant of works of old, and still it serves the covenant of grace. In the covenant of works it was prescribed as the condition which, being perfectly performed, would give a right to the reward. The covenant of grace may be considered either as it was made between Jehovah and the man, whose name is the branch, or as it is made by God with elect sinners and believers. In the former consideration it is certainly of grace, almost exceeding belief, that God, 
should not only admit of a surety, but should also himself give him unto us, but yet it behoved the surety to satisfy according to the rigour of the law, which was greater in relation to him than in the first covenant between God and Adam. For by it Adam was bound either to obedience perfect in all respects, or to punishment, but our surety was bound to both at once. Perpetual life was promised to Adam, provided he would obey. But the reward of his work was not promised to our surety, except he should at once both perform the most perfect obedience to the law, and likewise endure the punishment due to sin. And therefore the law, in all its rigour, both as to its preceptive part and as to its penal sanction, is the condition of that covenant which took place between God and the surety. But if the covenant of grace be considered as made between God and the elect, I do not think that it should be said that the law, as sincerely performed by us, is also the condition of this covenant. For it has been abundantly shown above that they are egregiously mistaken who contend that sincere obedience performed to the command of Christ, which may come under the name of faith, has succeeded in place of perfect obedience which was demanded in the first covenant. Yet the law is in many respects related to the covenant of grace. First, inasmuch as by the cooperation of the Spirit of grace it divests a man of all confidence in his own virtue and righteousness, and by the knowledge of his misery constrains him to be humble, and so leads him to Christ, exhibited in the Gospel, Romans 10.5, Galatians 3.24. Secondly, inasmuch as it enters into the promises of the covenant, among which that is not the least which respects the writing of the law in the hearts of the elect, Jeremiah 31.33. Thirdly, inasmuch as it is a draft of true virtue, as delineation of inward and outward goodness, and an example of that holiness which God approves, and which we ought to follow. Fourthly, inasmuch as sincere obedience to it conduces very much to the glory of God, and to the edification of our neighbour, and to procure many advantages to ourselves. For sincere obedience to the divine law is a proof and an evidence of unfeigned faith, of Christ dwelling in us by his Spirit, of regeneration and renovation according to the image of God, and of our adoption to the glorious inheritance. Besides, it brings us peace of conscience, consolation against the reproaches of enemies, friendly and familiar communion with God, and the boldness of faith and hope at the very point of death, so that in fine it is not only useful to obtain the possession of salvation, but also so necessary that without it no man shall see God. Which things have been lately demonstrated more at large, and all these the law does not from its own authority which can admit of nothing unless perfectly pure and condemns whatever is polluted with the least stain but from the authority of christ's grace to which it is now subservient and by whose command it declares that the works performed by the sanctifying grace of the spirit though imperfect are sincere and so far approves of them as agreeable to it these are the relations of the law inasmuch as it is subservient to the covenant of grace and hence methinks that much tossed question may be easily decided whether the covenant of grace or the gospel has also a law peculiar to itself. Indeed, if by the gospel we understand the whole body of that doctrine which was preached by Christ and the apostles, there is no doubt but that whatever belongs to any duty is not only repeated but also more clearly delivered in the gospel, and with stronger exhortations than was ever done by Moses and the prophets." and so far that part of evangelic doctrine may be called the command of christ the law of christ and the perfect law of liberty for why may we not boldly say what the spirit of god has said before us certainly it wants not its own weight what paul said of the new testament epi kritosin epangelies it was brought into the form of a law by better promises hebrews eight six for even the doctrine of faith is sometimes inculcated under the form of a command mark one fourteen and fifteen acts sixteen thirty one but if we take the word gospel in a strict sense as it is the form of the testament of grace which consists of mere promises or the absolute exhibition of salvation in christ then it properly prescribes nothing as duty it requires nothing it commands nothing no not so much as to believe trust hope in the lord and the like but it relates, declares, and signifies to us what God in Christ promises, what he willeth and is about to do. Every prescription of duty belongs to the law, as the venerable Voetius, after others, hath inculcated to excellent purpose. Disputation, Tom 4, page 24, etc. 
and this we must firmly maintain if with all the reformed we would constantly defend the perfection of the law as containing in it all virtues and all the duties of holiness yet the law as adapted to the covenant of grace and according to it written in the hearts of the elect commands them to embrace with an unfeigned faith all things proposed to them in the gospel and to order their lives agreeably to that grace and glory and therefore when god in the covenant of grace promises to an elect sinner faith repentance and consequently eternal life then the law whose obligation can never be dissolved and which extends itself to every duty obliges the man to assent to that truth highly to esteem the good things promised, earnestly to desire, seek, and embrace them. Further, since the wonderful providence of God has ranged the promises in that order, that faith and repentance shall precede and salvation follow, man is bound by the same law to approve of and to love his divine disposal, nor may he promise himself salvation, but in a way agreeable to it. And accepting the promises of the covenant in that order in which they are proposed he obliges himself by that acceptance to apply to the duties contained in the preceding promises before he can hope to obtain the enjoyment of the latter and in this respect the covenant is mutual god proposes his promises in the gospel in a certain order man by virtue of the law subservient to the covenant of grace is bound to embrace these promises in that order while faith does that the believer obliges himself to study newness of life before he forms hopes of a blessed life and in this manner the compact is between two parties. Since, therefore, we now understand how the law is subservient to the covenant of grace and the gospel, there is no doubt but these truths ought also to be preached under the evangelical economy of the New Testament, and that, not slightly indeed, but in a diligent and serious manner, that the soul, struck with a deep sense of sin, may pant after the grace of Christ, acknowledge the excellence of that most perfect obedience which he fulfilled for his people, properly esteem the benefit of the law written in their mind, be inflamed with love to that unspotted purity which is delineated in the law, explore the duties of that gratitude which it owes, be an honour and a praise to God, an example to others, and in fine, may apply to its own salvation with all becoming diligence. Meanwhile the gospel must also be preached in all the riches of its grace, that the soul may be convinced that its salvation is placed entirely in the grace of God and in the satisfaction of Christ, that nothing is either done by itself or ever can be done, whereby it may procure even the smallest particle of a right to life, that Christ by his powerful grace prevents sinners, and often in that very moment wherein they are incredibly mad in their wickedness, with an outstretched hand apprehends them as his own property, and without any previous laudable disposition, by the first communication of his spirit, unites them to himself in order to a new life. A life which he undertakes to cherish, excite, preserve, and prolong to a blessed eternity. And though it is not possible that he who is quickened by Christ should not live to Christ, yet there is nothing in which even he who lives most circumspectly can glory, nothing of which he can boast, or which he can show to God, or in fine, which he ought not to renounce, as far as it is of himself, and as far as it is of the Spirit of God, impute it entirely to divine grace. For these things are both so great, and truths of such importance, that they cannot be sufficiently inculcated. And thus both law and gospel should be preached in the highest point of perfection under the evangelical economy, so that by the gospel nothing may be detracted from the obligation of the law, in as far as it enjoins holiness becoming God, nor by the law anything in the least derogated from the superabundant grace of the gospel. But in what order is this preaching to be conducted? To me the question seems almost superfluous and unprofitable, since the preaching of both should always be conjoined. For who will approve of such an imprudent judge of matters, who resolves by the continual proclamation of the law for some months to soften souls and to prepare them for Christ, and in the meantime makes no mention of Christ? or who for a remarkable space of time soothes the ears with the allurements of the gospel only and does not at the same time inculcate that we must live as becometh the gospel in vain do you strike the mind with the terror of the law yea you will not even do this unless you also point out jesus to whom we must flee for refuge neither does ever the saving grace of god shine upon men but it immediately teaches them that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts they should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world with one breath christ proclaimed repent and believe the gospel and said peter repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins 
And in that first discourse, with many other words, did he testify and exhort his hearers, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Acts 2.38 and 40. Everywhere, as often as the apostles went to minister the word, they both preached Jesus with the resurrection of the dead, and commanded men to repent, because God hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath appointed. Acts 17, 18, 30, and 31. And Paul did not deal privately with Felix without reasoning concerning faith in Christ, and also at the same time concerning righteousness and chastity and judgment to come. Acts 24, 24, and 25. Likewise, when he makes mention of its entrance among the Thessalonians, he says, Ye know how we exhorted and comforted, and charged every one of you, as a father his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you to his kingdom and glory. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. The declaration of faith, and the exciting to the study of holiness, ought to be always so conjoined that the one never be torn from the other. Nor are we bound by any rule, always to premise to other things, either these which belong to the law, or these which belong to the gospel. The order of a discourse is arbitrary, and to be prudently varied according to the variety of subjects and persons. I do not conceal, however, that, in my judgment, the beginning of the new life is not from the preaching of the law, but of the gospel. The gospel is the seed of our regeneration, and the law of the spirit of life, which makes us free from the law of sin and death. Doubtless, while Christ is preached, and life through him, his spirit falls upon the souls of the elect, and infuses into them a principle of spiritual life. Because of his own will begat he us by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first-fruits of his creatures, James 1.18. Paul, of old, asked the Galatians, chapter 3, verse 2, This only would I learn of you, received ye the spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. But when that life, infused by the Spirit, through means of the gospel, begins to exert itself, if I am not deceived, it generally proceeds in the following order, that the soul, awakened as from a deep sleep, or faint, or rather death, views itself polluted with sin, guilty of many crimes, abominable unto God, most miserable in every respect, and altogether unable to deliver itself, and therefore, seized with pungent grief and despairing of itself, it pants after salvation." about to come to it from another quarter, to which purpose the ministry of the law is useful. Anon it sees Christ held forth in the gospel, and discovering that in him there is a fullness of salvation, and an abundance of grace, it immediately betakes itself to him, altogether empty of itself, that it may be filled by him, destroyed in and of itself, that it may be saved by him. It is not possible that apprehending Christ and being apprehended by him, it should not, through his inestimable goodness, be inflamed with love to him, and be willing to devote itself wholly to his service, to whom it professes to owe its salvation, nor is it possible that it should not acknowledge him for a Lord, whom it hath found by experience to be a saviour. And thus again the gospel brings us back to the law as a rule of gratitude. Hence it is evident how law and gospel mutually assist one another in promoting the salvation of the elect, and how sometimes the former, sometimes the latter, takes the lead." End of chapter 17。Chapter 18 of Conciliatory or Ironical Animadversions on the Controversies Agitated in Britain under the Unhappy Names of Antinomians and Neonomians by Herman Witsius. Translated by Thomas Bell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Conclusion Thus far have we disputed concerning these things from which I draw the following inferences, that it will be our best if, leaving the dangerous precipices of opinions, we walk on the easy, the plain, and safe way of Scripture, the simplicity of which is vastly preferable to all the sublimity of high-swollen science, if we are not afraid to say what Scripture says, foolishly hoping, by our more convenient phrases, to polish those which seem somewhat rugged, and do not, by expressions rigid, stubborn, hyperbolical, and unusual to the Holy Spirit, sharpen the moderate language of Scripture, giving none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. If, finding that some things rather incautious have dropped from us, we candidly and generously cancel, correct, or retract them, and what things have unwillingly fallen from others, provided it appear they were not from an evil design, let us rather assist these with a favourable interpretation than torture them with a rigid. If we so assert the free grace of God, that no pretext be given to the licentiousness of the flesh, so extol free justification, that nothing be derogated from sanctification, 
so inculcate the one righteousness of Christ, which only can stand before the divine tribunal, that neither the utility nor the reward which Scripture assigns it be denied to our piety. In fine, so preach the saving grace of the gospel, that the most holy law may still have its place and its use. If on both sides we sincerely do these things by the goodness of God, it shall follow that, instead of the quibbles of obscure controversy, the clear day shall begin to shine, and the day-star arise in our hearts. Instead of the briars and brambles of thorny disputation, righteousness and peace shall spring out of the earth, and banishing the contentions of unhappy differences, we shall all, as with one voice, celebrate the glorious grace of God in Christ, and with united strength eagerly adorn the chaste bride, the Lamb's wife, with the embroidered garments of the beauties of holiness, and with the golden chain of Christian virtues. With which benefit, through the unsearchable riches of his free grace, may we be graciously honoured by the blessed God, the only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in light inaccessible, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. So I wrote, and warmly urged, at Utrecht, on the 8th of the calendar of March, 1696, and again at Leiden, 1699. End of chapter 18. End of conciliatory or ironical animadversions on the controversies agitated in Britain under the unhappy names of antinomians and neonomians by Herman Witsius.